Hello, good afternoon. <clears throat> it is I, Hitman. This afternoon I'm bringing to you a discussion on Caesar and Caesarism. I am delighted to be joined by the uh, wonderful and uh, Roman-pilled uh, Marcus Virus Person X. How are you? Uh, in, on that basis, salve to everyone, or salve kiwis. <laughs> Thank you for having me on, uh, Hitman. As always, um, I love you get you know we we've only had a few but we've had wonderful discussions and um like uh, I, I, well for anyone who's listening who who's interested we've been actually trying to tee this up for a couple of weeks and, and initially it was meant to be yourself columba and i but sadly columba can't join us um but it has been a long time in the making we've been meaning to do this stream and uh and i've been very keen because caesar is probably one of my uh favorite historical subjects in terms of the study of a person and i would say caesar's probably the one person who as a boy kind of really sparked my imagination from a historical standpoint. And as I've got old and I've obviously read more about him, you know, you read Plutarch, you read Suetonius, you, know, you read, uh, um, you know, the, the Augustan histories, etc. cetera. Um, the, or, you know, like people who've written sort of in the context of the Julio Claudians writ large, and you sort of get a more mature opinion of Caesar um, as time goes on. But that notwithstanding, he's certainly a hugely influential figure not only in sort of Roman and Italian history, but in Western history himself. Uh, you know, Caesar, he's probably responsible in his own lifetime himself for probably two significant hinge points in Western history. One man, you know, he's he's definitely in that sort of Napoleon Alexander kind of category. So I'm very glad that you, you came up with this idea to discuss it because it is a fantastically um, sort of colourful yet interesting part of history. Mm, and indeed, I think... Um with especially this concept of Caesarism that was coined by uh, Oswald Spengler in his um, work, Decline of the West. I think it's a, a concept which is very important to the, uh, the present time that, that we live in. So, uh, okay, so to get us started, I sort of wanted to do a sort of a very rough chronology of um, Caesar's life and the events thereof. Uh, so, to start with, so who exactly was Julius Caesar? Well, he was, well, his full name is a uh, Gaius Ulius uh, Caesar, if we're using the correct uh, Latin pronunciation, but I'll just call him Caesar for ease of understanding for everybody, because that's how he's typically been, been called contemporarily. Uh, yes, not, so... not, many, not many people tend to call him Gaius, so <laughs> we'll call him sort of Julius Caesar, yeah, <laughs> for shorthand. Yes, um, yeah, so what's important is with the Romans is their middle name known as the Noman is actually their family name, um, so, and it's important because in Rome you have these many uh, powerful um, and no um, sort of long-lasting patrician houses and yeah. Caesar belonged to the Julii clan or, or gens as it's mm. called mm. Who, who could be described as the aristocratic class of the Roman Republic um, yes indeed and um, who sort of rose to prominence after they um, got rid of their, their the last king uh, Tarquinius Superbus in the um, the 6th century if I recall uh, so yeah, so the Julii are one of these um, powerful um, families. Um, what's also really important is the Julii and Caesar himself um, claim descent from Venus. Um, so not only is he of noble blood, but supposedly of divine heritage as well. Indeed, yeah, yeah. The, Ju the Julii sort of consider themselves darlings of Venus. Yeah, because later on, when Caesar was dictator, he builds a temple in the Roman Forum of Venus. Uh, Genetrix, um, I believe, is the uh, aspect of Venus um, that he dedicated it to. Mm, correct. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's who's so born into this clan of all family. Uh, so very noble. Uh, uh, just while we're on the topic of birth, Hitman, just if I may, we, this will probably come up a bit later too, but he is also the nephew of Gaius Marius because his mother, Aurelia, is a, a blood relation of Gaius Marius as well. And Caesar is sort of born and his childhood and adolescence is in the context of the, the social war and the power struggle between Gaius Marius and Sulla. So we should keep that in context too. Oh, yeah, um, certainly. I was literally about to say he was related oh, to Marius. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my, my apologies. No, it's fine. Um, yes, and it's interesting because Marius was very much of plebeian origin. So, you, you know, you've got this interesting dynamic where you've got this scion of nobility being related to a someone who was of the plebeian origin though a very um very important military reformer because Gaius Marius initiated the Amarian reforms these mm. drastic um restructuring of the Roman army from the old um sort of 
triplex of sort of Assis um, levy system where you'd have these sort of free citizens who would fight and die for the Republic to this mm. uh, system of um, when our and land would... and landed citizens specifically, yes. um, which mm. which as we sort of talk about Caesar Caesarism creates this massive demographic problem in Rome, which sort of hits a zenith in the context of the Gallic Wars. Um, but as as manpower hemorrhaged, um, and like you were saying, Marius was for, was forced to reform the army in the in the face of the Cimbrian Wars. So. My, Marius is a very important person as well, even though he's of plebeian origin. Um, we could probably say that he's of a of a of a cadre of these novo homo, these new men who come into Roman politics, of which Cicero is another one. Marcus Tullius Cicero is another one of these men of Marius' generation that rises to the top. Mm. Yes, certainly. Uh, yes, so anyway, so yeah. Uh, so what happens early in his life is, and because of the association with Marius, and um, he was obviously at odds with them. Um, Sulla and I think Caesar does have to leave Rome for a short period of time to, you know, basically not get hunted down or um, killed by him by Sulla, which is um, understandable. Uh, so in his young life, he does go off into the eastern provinces and he is captured by um, some of the Calician pirates who he is forced to spend several months in captivity. Um, he does sort of befriend them though a little bit, but he does joke, oh, "Don't worry, when I'm free, I'm just going to have you all slaughtered," which he does. Um, he does honour that pledge when he finally um, escapes. I I actually think, uh, if, if memory serves me correct, these are two separate parts of his life. They're very closely related, though, um, because Caesar's father uh, passes away when I think Julius Caesar's only four, 13 or 14, like just on the cusp of sort of adolescence. And so Caesar, due to Roman law, becomes head of the family, um, certainly of his specific clan you know the 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 caesar clan within the sort of julii uh, sorry uh, uh, yeah the sort of caesar clan of the sort of gens julii um and uh and as a and in order to teach um or, or to, to tutor caesar as many roman aristocrats did he was actually sent to greece um i believe to rhodes was his destination i can't actually remember the scholar he was meant to uh, learn under but it was actually um it was actually en route to being educated i think when he was sort of 15 16 um he he was captured by the pirates and, and it's quite an amusing story can we opine a little just a tad on the pirate story because i actually sure. love yeah. this aspect of his because you gotta think he's so precocious and bold as a as a teenager and and for anyone who witnessed this this would have um been very uh you might say indicative of his future and particularly of his temperament and his character so most people in captivity captivity you know would be sort of you know i'll oh, plead for mercy please don't kill me you know etc etc caesar in, you know, makes himself comfortable amongst his captors. Caesar um, frequently reads them his poetry and his writing and castigates these men for being savage when they don't sort of applaud or clap him after he recites things. Um, and if they ever revealed like a disgusting habit, he would chastise them for their savagery. And he'd often mock them saying that, um, you know, if, if they weren't more friendly or compliant towards him, he'd have them all hanged or crucified. And they would laugh it off thinking it's a joke. Like, what's this precocious 15-year-old, etc. But when, oh, and of course, very famously, um, when they sent an envoy to Rome for the ransom, they they made the demand of, um, you know, oh, 10 talents of gold for this young Roman. And he, he scoffs and bursts out laughing. And he says, you know, do you not know who I am? I'm of the Gens Julii. My family will pay 20 talents. <laughs> You know, it's it's remarkable, you know, how um to, to use a word, the chutzpah that Caesar shows in the face of these sort of cutthroat pirates. Um, and of course, once the ransom is paid, the pirates just think, oh, off goes this teenager, you know, we've made our our money, all is well. But Caesar makes his way to the nearest naval fleet, which is in on somewhere in the proximity of the Ionian coast, alerts the the garrison there and the commander, and while they sail back to the to the island, they take the captive's pirate. By the, the pirates captive and caesar as a teenager demands that as you know as, as a son of an aristocrat as the as the as the um the scion as, as the leader of the julii family you know of, of the clan um insists that these pirates are crucified and because he liked them he actually hastens their death by having their their throat slit to like you know quicken their death rather than just hanging on the cross so that's caesar as a teenager um and uh and then afterwards he does return to rome after this escapade but then immediately almost immediately after he leaves rome again because like you say sulla is engaging in the prescriptions and so caesar takes a posting in um in asia minor 
and joins the Legion at 16 or 17 years old and actually fights in the Eastern War, um, ironically, under the, um, well, Lucullus, Lucius Lucullus is the one who's commanding the campaign, but another general who's obviously operating that theatre and actually annexes the province of Caligula, or Cilicia, depending how you want to pronounce it, is actually Gnaeus Pompeius. So there's an interesting kind of intersection of history here already. Well, yes, I think well, in this time, all of these interesting figures all interconnect with one another, you know, Marius, Sulla, Pompey, Caesar, and, um, and Crassus as well, because uh, both um, Pompey and Crassus, Caesar's partners in the First Triumvirate, both sort of made their names serving un under Sulla. And um, going back to that tutor, uh, it was Apollonius, according to Plutarch, who he went to Apollonius, study Apollonius, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. I, I just couldn't remember his name, but it was Apollonius, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, so when he's in the East, he is put in charge of one of the provinces, and there's actually here's the first bit from Plutarch that I'd like to read. So this is uh, section four of his life with Caesar. On his return to Rome, he impeached Dolabella for maladministration in his province, and many of the cities of Greece gave evidence in support of the charge. Dolabella, indeed, was acquitted, but to make some return to the Greeks for their zeal in his behalf, Caesar assisted them in their prosecution of Publius Antonius for corruption before Marcus Lucullus, the governor of Macedonia, and his aid was so effectual that Anton Antonius appealed to the tribunes urging that he had not a fair trial in Greece with the Greeks for his accusers. At Rome, Caesar got a brilliant popularity by aiding at trials with his eloquence, and he gained also much good will by his agreeable mode of saluting people and his pleasant manners. Though he was more attentive to please than persons usually are at that age, he was also gradually acquiring political influence by the splendour of his entertainment and his table and of his general mode of living. At first, those who envied him thinking that when his resources failed, his influence would soon go, did not concern themselves about his flourishing popularity, but at last, when his political power had acquired strength and had become difficult to overthrow and was manifestly tending to bring about a complete revolution, they perceived that no beginning should be considered too small to be capable of quickly becoming great, but uninterrupted endurance and having no obstacle to their growth by reason of being despised, Cicero, who was considered to have been the first to suspect and to fear the smiling surface of Caesar's policy, as a man with the smiling smoothness of the sea, and who observed the bold and determined character, which was concealed under a friendly and joyous exterior, so that in all his designs and public measures he perceived a tyrannical purpose. But on the other hand, said he, when I look at his hair, which is arranged with so much care, and see him scratching his head with one finger, I cannot think that such a wicked purpose will enter into this man's mind as the overthrow of the Roman state. This, however, belongs to a later period. So that's a really interesting passage from Plutarch there. So already mm -hmm. early, Caesar's cultivating this sort of rhetorical skill and winning people over. And um, it's mm -hmm. just interesting, you've got Caesar having some initial suspicion, but then sort of you know, brushing it off a bit. The other aspect to consider is Plutarch cites his... Uh his propensity for lavish parties and, and extensive entertaining and being, yes. um, uh, you know, he, he's, he's very sort of, he has a tremendous sort of gaiety and uh, gregariousness about him that makes him such a, a magnetic personality. People want to know Caesar. They want to be around Caesar. He has this, you know, already at such a young age, if I can sort of, you know, cite this, uh, you know, the, the notion of the Mos Maiorum, you know, the, the Roman ways, Caesar is already, you know, as a, as a, either an older teenager or as a very, very young adult, is already exhibiting tremendous capacity for autoritas, um, which is like the ability to sort of command respect as one of the virtues of, of Rome, of, of what the Romans considered sort of their virtues, autoritas is one of them. Um, and already, although perhaps he's not the statue that he would acquire sort of after the Gallic Wars or after the Civil Wars, Caesar is already a person to be taken seriously. Like Plutarch says, you know, he's seen scratching his very carefully arranged hair with one finger scratching his head and he cannot he can't fathom this that this would be a man who's you know such monstrous ideas can enter his mind because he's sort of so beautiful you might say you know he's he's a, he's a beautiful ex um uh, exemplar of rome yet caesar is sort of already already the sort of jack and uh, where's it the Hyde and jekyll character where he's sort of got like this sort of light side this dark side caesar exhibits this at a very young age and it's a it's a part of you know the caesar character all the way through his life and it just starts here, you know. Mm -hmm. So in other words, um, Caesar passes the physiognomy check. Yes. 
<laughs> you might say he might say in this in this base on this basis he's most certainly based. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm, it, yeah, certainly, and then and yeah, as he's growing up, not only is he um, sort of flexing his rhetorical skill, um, he's also um, really making a big. Because I think by this point, I think Sulla has um, resigned the dictatorship, or may have, he might have actually died at this point. I think so. Caesar's now more openly associating himself with his uncle Marius, and um, here's another little bit from Plutarch. He received the first proof of the goodwill of the people towards him when he was a competitor against Caius Pompilius for a military tribuneship, and was proclaimed before him. He received a second and more con conspicuous uh, evidence of popular favour on the occasion of the death of Julia, the wife of Marius, when Caesar, who was her nephew, pronounced over her a splendid funeral oration in the Forum, and at the funeral ventured to exhibit the images of Marius, which were then seen for the first time since the administration of Sulla, for Marius and his son had been adjudged enemies. Some voices were raised against Caesar on account of this dis display, but the people responded by loud shouts and received him with clapping of hands and admiration that he was bringing back as from the regions of Hades, after so long an interval, the glories of Marius to the city. Now it was ancient Roman usage to pronounce funeral or orations over elderly women, but it was not customary to do it in the case of a young woman. And Caesar set the first example by pronouncing a funeral oration over his deceased wife, which brought him some popularity and won the, and won the many by sympathy to consider him a man of a kind disposition mm. and full of feeling. After the funeral of his wife, he went to Iberia as questor to the praetor Vetus, for whom he always showed great respect, and whose son he made his own questor when he filled the office of praetor. And his questorship, he married the third wife, Pompeia, led by his wife, Cornelia, a daughter, who afterwards married Pompeius Magnus. Owing to his mm. profuse expenditure... Yep. Oh, I just want to say that, that that funeral that you're talking about of, of that of the wife, I believe it was the daughter of the senator, Cinna or Cinna, C-I-N-N-A. Um, and that was basically Caesar's first political, politically strategic marriage. Um, but she, I believe, died in childbirth, if memory serves me correct. Um, I actually just can't remember what her name was, uh, uh, the daughter of um, Sinner. I've just had a massive mental blank. But yes, and then he does um, take on his third wife and, like, as you say, gives birth to his only daughter, Julia, who then marries, um, later on, would marry uh, Pompey in the context of the triumvirate. And then, as you say, then journeys to Spain to sort of climb the ranks of the, uh, the Roman sort of political machine. In, indeed. Uh, so I'm just trying to find my place where I was. Uh, yeah, married Pompey Magnus. It's owing to his profuse expenditure, and indeed men generally supposed that he was buying at a great cost a short-lived popularity, though in fact he was purchasing things of the highest value at a low price. It's said that by, but before he attained any public office, he was in debt to the amount of 1,300 talents. <laughs> Upon being approved, yes, a big spender. Oh, <laughs> actually... um. Uh, actually, you, you finish your if you get to a, like a full stop, and then I want to I want to come in with a with a quote. But continue, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, there's not much of this section left. Um, so upon being appointed curator of the Appian Road, he allowed up upon it a large sum of his own, and during his edileship, he exhibited three hundred and twenty pairs of gladiators. And by his liber liberality and expenditure on the theatrical exhibitions, the processions, and the public entertainments, he completely drowned all previous displays and put the people in such a humour that every man was seeking for new offices and new honours to requite with him. So again, he's just absolutely splashing out on all of these vast displays of, of wealth and entertainment and you know, winning people, people over. And it's interesting that you may be creator of the Appian Road because I recall, if I recall that's the main highway of Italy that connects to Rome, isn't it? Uh, yes, there's, uh, in fact, some parts of the old, actually many parts of the old Appian Way are still uh, used. Uh, in fact, if you make your way into the Roman, the, the metropolis of Rome today, um, you can actually drive along the Appian Way and parts of where the roads degraded or so longer used, they basically built a highway next to parts where it becomes more of a major road. Um, but yeah, it's it's a, <laughs> the Appian Way is as is, is, um, you know, Italian or as Roman as Italy itself. Oh, that's, um, that's fascinating. Mm, yeah, it's funny. You can actually like, still see like cars, you know, bob bob bobbing on the cobblestones and whatever. It's quite sort of... Uh, in, in fact, there's actually whole segments of Rome where you can still drive on cobblestones, and those cobblestones are literally millennia old. Wow. 
Uh, have you got to your full stop? Yeah, that was the end of that section. Yeah. Okay. Okay, because I I gotta. The thing is, I, I know people are probably gonna you know oh Suetonius because I mean yes yeah, Suetonius is a horrible is a is a, in many instances a horrible gossip, but I do like how he's so incisive. So I actually want to read um two of um uh, two of uh, 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 Suetonius's excerpts. One's describing Caesar, and the other is describing his party. So if I can read um. If I can read the bit about his personal appearance, um, Suetonius writes, um, uh, hang on. Here we are. He was particular of his personal appearance, clean shaven, sensitive of his premature balding, and though subject subject to epilepsy, his physical endurance was, in, was phenomenal. Actually, no, sorry, that's not Suetonius. That's actually Plutarch. I'm mistaken. So Plutarch said that about Caesar. So even though he had the premature balding, he was still a physically impressive man and and quite sort of handsome and neat and tidy. And this is a feature through that the entirety of his life. Um, so interesting that sort of Caesar would would show that. And and from what I actually have read in Suetonius, um, Caesar's basically considered vain. Um, you know, he pushes past that envelope of being sort of proud of, or, you know, of being... Um, how can I want to, how can I, how should I put this, how can I phrase this, you know, being, um, you know, wanting to present well and being neat and whatever to the point where Caesar was said to literally pluck individual body hairs with tweezers, you know, like Caesar takes it to the next level. You might say he had maybe a, a, a tinge of autism about him, but Caesar is very much a case of, um, you know, what you see is excellence. And then you, you might say he then plays that out in, life through his actions it's very much a case of this duality of caesar once again coming to the fore mm. well it's also important because the romans thought it was very important to be very mm. impeccable and clean because mm. you know and especially i know for many centuries they actually didn't wear mm. beards because they associated them with the barbarians and it wasn't until C um, emperor Hadrian correct wearing a beard. correct so actually the, the the sorry the quote continues if i if i may um sure uh, Caesar was well built with dark, lively eyes. He not only had his hair carefully trimmed, but also removed his body hair with tweezers. So, and that bit is from Suetonius. That's why I got confused with. So, um, you know, there's this there's this picture of Caesar that you sort of can conjure up in your mind. Um, you know, the, the the historians write about him in a very particular way. You don't sort of see this written about Marius or Pompey or you know Cassius Longinus or anything like that. It's they're very, very particular about the way they're, they're, um, they're describing Caesar. It, certainly in a physical standpoint, in, in, with these two quotes. Mm -mm. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And, yeah, so with Caesar's life, so after going to Spain and smashing out all, all of the money, the next major thing that happens is um, during, um, I hope I don't get the year wrong, but I think it's 60 BC, which is the year that Cicero was consul, and mm -hmm. the uh, conspir conspiracy of Catiline. And um, there's a, mm. another bit from Plutarch I want to read where um, Caesar um, sort of involves himself in sort of what to do with the conspirators. So this proposal appeared so humane and was supported by so powerful a speech that not only those who rose after Caesar sided with him, but many of those who had already spoken changed their opinions and went over to that of Caesar till it came to the turn of Cato and Catullus to speak. After they had made a vigorous opposition, and Cato in his speech had also urged suspicious matter against Caesar, and strongly argued against him, the conspirators were handed over to the executioner, and as Caesar was leaving the Senate, many of the young men, who then acted as a guard to Cicero, crowded together and threatened Caesar with their naked swords, but Ciro is said to have thrown his toga around Caesar, and to have carried him off, and Cicero also, when the young men looked to him, is said to have checked them by emotion, either for fear of the people or because he thought that the death of Caesar would be most unjust and a violation of law. If this is true, I cannot conceive why Cicero said nothing about it in the book of his consulship, but Cicero was blamed afterwards for not having taken advantage of so favourable an opportunity to get rid of Caesar, of having feared the people who were extravagantly attached to Caesar, and indeed a few days later, when Caesar had gone to the Senate and defended himself in a speech against the imputations that had been cast on him, and his speech was received with loud marks of disapprobation, and the sitting of the Senate was lasting longer than usual. The people came with loud cries and surrounded the Senate house, calling for Caesar and bidding the Senate let him go. Accordingly, Cato apprehending danger, mainly from some movement of the needy part of the people, 
who were like a firebrand among the rest of the citizens, as they had all hopes and Caesar prevailed on the Senate to give them a monthly allowance of corn, which produced an addition to the rest of the expenditure of seven millions five hundred thousands. However, the immediate alarm was manifestly quenched by this measure, which snapped off the best part of Caesar's influence and scattered it at a time when he was going to enter on his office a praetor, which made him some more formidable. So this is interesting. So essentially, with these conspirators, um, the Cicero and many of the senators just wanted to have them executed, but Caesar um, sort of beseeches on their behalf, using his skills of argumentation to argue that they're just um, exiled out of Rome instead. And um, they kind of come round to him, but as you can see, there was a moment where some of them very nearly murdered him. Um, and this makes me think of um, the incidents involving, you know, the brothers Graco, where they were both murdered by the by the senators. That Caesar very easily could have been another um, of the Gracchi being murdered on the floor of the Senate, but the people sort of come to his aid and help help defend him. Uh, so it just goes to show that all of Caesar's efforts were certainly bearing um, fruition. And it's also interesting again that Plutarch to me is making another swipe at a uh, Cicero, sort of saying, you know, this is the second time you you've not really taking Caesar seriously for who he is. What's your thoughts on that? Um, well, it's quite the insight into the political direction that Julius Caesar chooses to take. Um, even at this point in his career, Caesar's doing something which most politicians in Rome either don't think of or consider ghastly. I mean, this is a time where, you know, Rome had within the period of say 150 years as rome has you know prevailed in the punic wars as it's conquered macedon and to cite cato the elder the annexation of macedon basically trebled rome's treasury treasury in one campaign mm. um and right by this point rome has had absorbed pergamum it had conquered large parts of asia minor which were these wealthy eastern mediterranean cities um you know the the money was pouring into the republic Hmm. um and uh and and um on that basis you know most of these uh you know the aristocrats that the senators that made up the roman republic uh either would not have thought of or would have thought it contemptible to have engaged with um sort of low what we in one day would consider populist politics um and the point i was going to make about rome growing so much in 150 years is that the population of the city swells i mean rome is I don't think it's quite at a million at this point, but it's it's not far from a million. It is it's Rome has probably trebled or quadrupled in size in two hundred years, uh, and you know all this sort of housing in the suburb was sort of built, you know, willy nilly, hickledy pickledy, um, you know, the, these sort of allotments and tenements and insulae, um, all through the you know the the um, the, the non aristocratic parts of Rome, shall I say, and thus Rome was, you know, we have this we have this sort of mental image of you know cobbled streets and aqueducts and bathhouses and cleanliness and i mean that would have been true for, for large you know certain parts of the city and certain certainly parts of the city that were connected to the to the public you know water system which in itself at the heart of the empire had a had a um a bureaucracy of you know uh, thirty thousand people in the city alone it was a huge you know operation um so aristocrats senators would walk around rome with you know poses of flowers you know on their noses so they wouldn't smell the stench in the streets because the stretch you know the streets would be littered with you know the droppings from animals and you know feces and grot and dirt and all the things that come with living in a in a you know in a big popular city but rather than shunning those people caesar's actually made a constituent out of them he goes into the streets he goes into the forum and he meets people he talks to them he engages with them he because caesar's kind of like this half outsider in the shadow, this long shadow of, of the post Sulla Republic, um, Caesar finds a new constituent, the kind of people who rally around the tribune of the plebs. You know, those sort of people, basically the people who then go on to love Mark Antony afterwards. Um, mm. And that already makes Caesar dangerous. Mm. And sorry, what were you going to ask? Um, well, it's interesting as well, the idea of Rome's population swelling, because um, Obviously, with all these conquests, uh, many slaves came in, and mm. it's important that a lot of these slaves are foreigners from different parts of the empire. Mm. And also, early when you have the uh, the social war, 
and um, you have the, um, I don't know if enfranchisement, enfranch- enfranchisement's the right word, but, you know, all Italian... No, it, it's, that's correct. Mm. Yeah. yeah, all, all, all yeah. the Italic, all the Italic mm. Italian peoples, this being the, the Umbrians, the, the Oscans, the Samnites, the Sabines, the Fratellians, all these parts of, of Italy which are, shall I say, Latin-speaking or Latin-Italic people, but non-Roman become part an integral part of the republic they become as you say fully fledged citizens in the in the in the aftermath of the social war and um, yes and as you said we've got new men like cicero who people who were not originally from rome but from these other parts of italy mm. so you've got so yeah. again these well, are well, C- cicero was from modern day southern lazio he's from the a, a place called formia which is um on the coast but like you know right near naples and so okay. he was he was he's you know like he's not far from rome but he's not a true roman he's not a blue blood as it were mm. Mm. um yeah so again so this is where these masses are you've got these new the enfranchised um italian roman citizens coming in but also all of these um um i think a lot of these foreign um, types coming in too finding finding work or being brought in from the empire and um uh, okay if I can just briefly just add on to my point ever so slightly. Um, mm. uh, and, and the thing is, is if you look at the actions of, of, or in this case, the inaction, the senators, there's sort of, there's this sort of uh, dualism where they willingly dealt with Catiline. And I mean, although Catiline was a more established man in Rome than what Caesar was at this point, certainly older, right? Um, and Catiline had his gangs and, you know, he, he, he was a person not without backing, but he was still, you know, compared to, say, even Gnaeus Pompeius, compared to Cicero, he was not of that quite same elite, as it were. And so he was dealt with. But with Caesar, it's this thing that the the, the Gens Julia, although they are a family that are on the wane, they haven't been a great family for a considerable amount of time. They're still an old, proper blue blood aristocratic family of Rome, basically from its foundation, you know, like the you know, like the Junii and, you know, like the, um, like the Livii, um, the Fabii, like these old, old families that have been around since, you know, the Republic was founded. Um, so he has that working in his favour compared to some of these sort of other, not quite novel homo, but these, these people who gained prominence after the establishment of the Roman Republic. Um, and inversely, he's got this sort of populist peasant streak from the Marian side, this, you know, from his uncle. Um, and so he kind of plays both of these games. Again, it's the duality of Caesar. He plays both of these with aplomb, even at a young age. And like I said, this is where sort of, you know, people like Cato the Younger and, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and Cicero, or maybe not Cicero, but, you know, the the like of the the, the more older, what we'd call the optimates, bro, right, um, would walk around Rome and poses of flowers and they'd, you know, hide the smell of the the streets you know from, from from their noses caesar just engages these people he speaks to them you know he he sort of presents this sort of you know this this gregariousness and this gay friendly manner i want mean, i mean sort of gaiety in the old definition um and and he becomes really likable like people already when caesar is taking up his praetorship in spain in, in hispania uh, i believe it's tataconesis is the province um it might be Baetica, but I can't remember. But he's he's in Spain, and already at this point, you know, Caesar's a person whose name is on the lips of people, and people either lo- love him or loathe him. But the fact is, he's got this blue blood sort of credential part of him innately, and this populist following that makes him. It's the fact that these two things exist in conjunction make him a dangerous person. Even though people at this point in time don't take him seriously, they say, "Oh, we should kill him," but they never think, "Oh, one day he might become dictator." There's always this belief that Caesar can, can be contained. And that even occurs up until the point where, you know, the, the Rubicon incident, that's a bit further ahead of time, of course. But there's always this belief that forces in Rome can contain Caesar. And it ends up being a fatal mistake for the Optimates, as we will find out later. Mm-hmm. Yes, and um, not sure in the chat says a friend of the working man. And um, yes, with what you just said, Marcus, I can't help but draw parallels between Caesar and uh, a certain uh, Donald Trump, though. Yeah, as it, as we've seen, though Trump didn't quite have, um, I think Caesar's um, spine, so to speak, his his rectitude. <laughs> yes, nor his nor his intellect actually. Even though I think people like Orange Man Bad had an, possesses a natural intellect of his own, and like Caesar was a man driven by instinct. I think this is why 
you know, it, it does take, you know, for someone to be, if I dare use the word, sort of braggadocious and to have chutzpah and everything, there has to be sort of muscle behind the hustle. And when I say muscle, I don't just mean muscular strength physically. I mean, like, brain power, you know, actual ability to sort of, like, to have in, incisive thinking and to be able to deliberate things then act with, with swiftness and decisiveness. This is where, for me, Julius Caesar is actually one of the greatest people in history. And for me, in that capacity alone, I think he exceeds Alexander. I think he exceeds Napoleon. I think he exceeds Scipio or Hannibal. Is that, I mean, eventually he's killed, right? We'll get to that. I, I know I've, 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 made, I've ruled the spoiler. I'm sorry, but you're like, we know Caesar's, we know Caesar's killed at the end, right? I mean, God, dramatic. If, if you didn't know that and watching this stream, God help you. But, um, but you know, he, he, um, he doesn't actually fail, if you get what I mean. You know, he's he's not, you know, like, yes, he's assassinated, but he's not disempowered. He's not imprisoned. You know, he doesn't have like this mass rebellion against him. In fact, when he is killed, the Roman people are livid. And the origins of that adoration for Caesar start here at this point. And I suppose that's where you can say this is where populism in the context of, we're talking about the Roman optimates, right? But this is where... Um, hostile elites are afraid of populist movements caesar's the, the 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 historically one of the greatest if not the greatest exemplar of that yes and with you saying that marcus i my mind goes back to that scene from hbo's rome where um it's just after antony's had um or done caesar's funeral speech and the crowd go go, go ballistic and all of the uh you know mm. Brutus and um and he throws the bloody toga into the crowd, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, and they're all cowering in the house, and they're like, "You stirred up a, a mob," um, and um, and uh, was it Longina says something to the effect of, "And well, us men of quality, and then shall restore order." And um, then Anthony delivers that like infamous line, and he says, "I have an angry mob at my back who will eat your men of quality in the halls of the Senate House." yeah yeah it's a it's it's true like yeah. <laughs> you know and, and i suppose I, I know this is obviously an embellishment but it's the whole um you know oh we have the lictors and and the, the urban cohorts and the prefects and then the anti retorts like oh we'll just rally the bakers and then the flute players and you'll have yourself a you know a triumph you know the, the mob um, were not to be taken lightly in rome and yeah. caesar's and again, life and his death proved that Yes, and again, not sure the Jan Jan six. Yes, that like when you saw those images of all of those um, congressmen and senators cowering when you had the people outside, it was history repeating itself. In yes, a way. It, it, just with just without um, a river being traversed. But anyway, yes, I, we shan't go there today. Yeah, no, right. Uh, yeah, there's now a little bit from Plutarch I want to read. So, okay, no tumults occurred in. Caesar's praetorship, but a disagreeable incident happened in his family. Publius Clodius, a man of patrician rank, was distinguished both by wealth and eloquence, by an arrogance and impudence. He was not inferior to the most notorious scoundrels in Rome. Clodius was in love with Pompeia, Caesar's wife, and Pompeia was in no way adverse to him. But a strict watch was kept over the woman's apartment, and Aurelia, Caesar's mother, who was a prudent woman by always observing Pompeia, made it difficult and hazardous for the lovers to have an interview. Now, the Romans have a goddess who they called Bona, as the Greeks have a gynosir. The Phrygians, who claim this goddess, say that she was the mother of King Midas. The Romans say she was a dryad and the wife of Faunus, but the Greeks say she is one of the mothers of Dionysus, whose name must not be uttered, and this is the reason why they cover the tents with vine leaves during the celebration of her festival. And the sacred serpent sits by the goddess, according to the mythos. No man is allowed to approach the festival, nor be in the house during the celebration of the rites, but the woman by the themselves are said to perform many rites similar to the Orphic and the celebration. Accordingly, when the season of the festival is come, a husband, if he be consul or praetor, leaves the house and every male also quits it, and the wife taking possession of the house makes all arrangements, and the chief ceremonies are celebrated by night, the evening festival being accompanied with mirth and much music. So what this is referring to is during this sort of um, um, religious practice, um, Caesar's wife um, is essentially believed to be having an affair with a fellow called Clodius, and um, what happens is Clodius trying to see. Well, that's a mother, that's a change for Caesar. Usually, he's the one doing the adultering. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, and it's um, uh, but anyway, Clodius decides to uh, 
sneak in to see his darling during this um, austere um, event where she's not allowed to see any men by dressing up as a woman. And then he's accosted in the halls of um, the house by a servant. And this causes a whole load of drama. And Caesar is forced to divorce his wife over this because it, it was such a scandal. He couldn't, he wasn't prepared to sort of let it study his political reputation. Indeed. And also to um, such an event, you know, like, how can I put this? Caesar, there's a question, if, if we sort of get to here, uh, maybe further in the stream or whatever, but there's a quote by Suetonius about sort of, how shall I say, Caesar's um, carnal appetites and the fact that um, Caesar was a lover of beauty and there was sort of never a shortage of um, prominent men's wives who enjoyed Caesar's company. And that in itself garners a reputation. Again, you, you're making comparisons to, you know, orange man bad, right? Um, again, there's that sort of that man of power, man of um, of, of of gravity, of, of status, of uh, and and from a characteristic standpoint of sort of boldness and brashness that certain women find appealing. Um, that kind of a man can't afford to be um, sort of cuckolded. <laughs> so for Caesar, no, totally he really had no alternative than to sort of terminate that marriage on that basis with the affair with his wife and Clodius. Yeah, no, understandably. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, and then after this, he marries Calpurnia, who was his uh, third and final wife, though certainly not his final lover, as, we, as we'll get to. So Indeed. Yeah. And we shan't spoil that one. We'll save that for later. Right, and uh, so shortly after this, he um, he formally enters into alliance with um, Crassus, um, because whereas Caesar um, does have the name, you know, being of the Uli gens and having the support of the um, the people too, he doesn't have that much money because he's spending it all. So he allies with Crassus. Well, rather, he's tremendously in debt even at this point. Yes, and so he allies with Crassus because Crassus is fabulously wealthy, having largely profited from Sulla's uh, prescriptions. And um, interestingly enough, um, just going back to Trump again, um, making all these comparisons between Caesar and Trump, I actually think Crassus is a better comparison considering Crassus what did he make his wealth in? It was in property. What did Trump make his um, wealth in? It was property. Mm. And, and also, um, Crassus never actually had a military career, uh, as with, again, not to spoil, but let's just say that his military forays in our circles should be well known. And, um, and that's because he was a man not experienced in warfare and never went to sort of military academies and never served as a centurion, which Caesar does do as a young, very young man. Um, and this becomes evident, you know, with the disaster at Cairo. Um, and again, you know, Caesar did, I think, uh, sorry, uh, Trump did his military uh, college or whatever it was at that high school that he went to, but he actually, you know, very quite famously didn't go to Vietnam um, and never served in the military. So I think on, on that basis, you know, he's, he's sort of the personality of Caesar, but with the life of Crassus, I think is probably a good way to summarise Trump in this, in this mm -hmm. sense. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yes, uh, though Crassus um, did um, command the force that finally put down the Second Servile War and defeated Spartacus, though... That's a good point. Uh, yeah. yeah. But then again, it was a, bun a bunch of slaves, though slaves that did know how to fight and did give many other Roman commanders um, several humiliations, so to speak. Indeed. So... Uh, luckily for Crassus, he was tackling Spartacus and not Sartorius. That would have been a very different <laughs> outcome, I'm sure. Uh, oh, yes, and... Yes, because then Pompey dealt with them, Sertorius. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah, so he forms a triumvirate with um, Crassus. So because Crassus has the wealth, Caesar's got the name and the support for people, which Crassus doesn't have because Crassus, his family, is not of the same pedigree as Caesar's. And also it, had to, it must be said, what makes Caesar valuable in the triumvirate is that he's this new force in Rome. He's the young up-and-comer. You know, for, like for anyone... I hate to use a sport analogy, but for anyone who watches sport, like you know, all the teams want to get the new hot prospect. They want, they want, they want to, you know, own that contract. And the same way with politics, you know, if you're a, if you belong to a political faction of any kind, you want the most promising young figure in your corner, not the opposition's corner, because that means victory, not defeat. If you get what I mean, um, Caesar represents this in terms of p politics. Like uh, you know, you can consider that Crassus. Is probably a generation older. Pompey's probably half a generation, if not a generation older. Um, and Cicero's definitely only half a generation older than 
Caesar. But these people are established and are older than Caesar and have more renown than Caesar. Caesar is that young up and coming man. I mean, actually, we didn't even, um, I don't think, oh, well, actually, it happens just about now um, when Caesar does secure his consulship and he absolutely, you know, trounces his co consul, Bibulus. I don't want to say too much, so I'm sure we'll, you, you're bound to get there in a sec. But um, the point is that he's this up and coming political force and Pompey and Crassus would rather ally with that than make an enemy of it, is the point hmm. I think. No, it's, no, it makes sense. Um, actually, speaking of Caesar age, there is a quote from Plutarch um, that he attributes to Caesar, which I think is interesting. And um, apparently, I think Caesar was travelling to Spain with some his men, and I think this is when he's about in his 30s still. Um, so basically, he would have been older than Alexander the Great um, would have been when, he, when Alexander dies. And he says, don't you think it is a matter for sorrow that Alexander was king of so many nations at such an early age? And I have as yet done nothing of note. So he uh, is, 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 is this the famous instance where he breaks down crying at the statue out of frustration and just anger because he's like essentially a nobody compared to Alexander the age? Is that the same? Uh, well, this is section 11 of the life of Caesar, still relatively early. Um, but it yeah. says, but he's been given a praetorship of Spain, and it's something he says on the way. He just got breaks down yeah. in despair because. Yeah, he, feel, he, he feels like a failure because Alexander the Great had conquered half the known worlds. Yeah, the time no, no, it, it's the same instance. It's the same thing that we're talking about. Yeah, he breaks down like in tears, just out of frustration. He's just, he's like, I'm, I'm dealing with petitions and scrolls, and you know, I'm, I'm, you know, bags of sesterci, and you know, dealing with, you know, administrative, you know tick boxing as it were and you know and and alexander marched his full entities all the way to the indus and you know and yeah mm -hmm. and for someone of caesar's in a raw unbridled ambition that like he has this moment where he's just so overcome with frustration and and sort of self-disappointment he actually breaks down in tears at the feet foot of this statue in um in i think it's Taraka. i'm pretty sure it's in somewhere in eastern spain or, or or somewhere along along the coast there um it's quite a famous um instance um, yeah, certainly, and it's. Um, I think it's a very noteworthy that Plutarch did that because remember when Plutarch wrote his lives, they're the parallel lives. They're a life of a famous Greek and a famous Roman together. And who does he pair Caesar with? None other than Alexander the Great. So it's very deliberate him um, putting this there. But you know, I think it's a nice and um, absolutely, you know, it's a nice flourish. Absolutely, and, and the and the thing is, sometimes men exist. Um, you know, even though they might be separated by you know, eons of time, right? There are people who are sort of roughly contemporary that sort of do compare. I mean, it, I've always seen, I've, I've always seen um, in this case, right? Because um, there's a, actually a really good book. If anyone likes these sort of books, I definitely if you recommend it's called um, Masters of Command and it actually compares the life and the, the, the journeys of um, Alexander the Great, Hannibal Barker and Julius Caesar and sort of along 12 criteria, you know, um, insight intellect logistics providence you know all these criteria that summarize command the author kind of categorizes how each one applies to each commander in the context of their story and their success on the battlefield as as tactical commanders as operational commanders with logistics their campaigns their eventual achievements it's a very very good read i encourage anybody to read it. it's a fantastic book and then it, like just to, to to give us a contemporaneous analogy i've actually read a very similar book about um montgomery Patton, and rommel and you get what i mean like sometimes these men kind of exist in a time window or like this umbrella this time bracket and no one can help but make comparisons about them and i mean this thing with sort of caesar and alexander is just so it's so tempting like you can't help but engage in this this mental exercise of comparing one with the other no no certainly uh, so then after this happens, you know, he's still in Spain for a bit, but, um, and then you sort of have the, the triumvirate for firmly comes into, um, into fruition. And also while he's in Spain, he does actually win a battle, I believe against some, uh, rebel forces. And, um, on his way back to Rome, he wants, um, there's an incident where he wants to triumph. Um, but also it happens to be around the same time the consular elections are happening. And um, in order to run for consul, you have to be present in the city. And um, so Caesar says, um, but also if you're having a triumph, you can't 
you have to be invited into the city with your army. So there's, there's a dilemma. And so I think he wants permission to come in and do both. And his enemies just say no. So he has to choose one or the other. And he decides to give up the glory of a triumph in order to come in as a civilian and run for office. Um, and, and what's fascinating too is Caesar, I, I might have this incorrect, but I'm pretty sure it's right. Caesar would have been the youngest person since Scipio Africanus. Either him or Flamininus, I can't remember, but he would have been the youngest person to have, um, or the youngest Roman, you know, aristocrat to have hosted or, or been asked to, you know, partake in a triumph since one of those two. I can't remember which one it is, but, you know, you've got to think this is a couple of generations removed from either of those people. Um, and, and, and Caesar, uh, what one must consider also that in order to earn a triumph in Rome, you must have killed, I believe, it was, I think it's 5,000 enemy combatants. Like anything less than that, you're kind of just playing around. It's a skirmish. It's a, a non-entity. It's a non-event, non right? So Caesar obviously partakes in this mini campaign in Spain, which is his first taste of real military command. If you take the sort of the... Uh, the um, Obviously, he's he's partaken in warfare in Asia Minor and the the Aegean, but this is his actual first where he's in charge of, of a given unit of you know legionary, legionaries. Um, and so he, he earns this right. But like you say, he's caught in this sort of political dilemma of if I take the triumph, I can't run for consul. But as a part of the agreement with the triumvirate with Pompey and with Crassus, this consulship is essentially guaranteed. Like, you know, it's going to be him and Bibulus. And for him, he probably rightly presumes that in terms of the political ladder in Rome, attaining consulship is so important because we have to consider what always occurs after a consulship in Rome, you are given governorship of a province. Governorship of a province means the command of legions. And if Caesar wants to repay these horrific debts that he's incurred, he has to take that path. The triumph will give him prestige and notoriety and um, fame, but fame doesn't pay debts. <laughs> Victory and governorships pay debts. So ultimately, that's his logic, I would, I would say. In, in that sense mm, and then also remember with this triumvirate um he's that's the reason he's allied with pompey because pompey is the um you know the decorated military hero mm. you know defeating sartorius defeating um mithridates in the east um you know and annexing the rump state of the seleucid empire he brings antioch and coastal syria into the republic as well he annexes calicia destroys the calician pirates i mean pompey's a very um decorated man at this point he's probably the the leading man in rome at this point in time mm. yeah so mm. i just so want to say just quickly because i mentioned I, I mentioned debt before this this instance with caesar's debt because we actually kind of missed this um prior to him going to spain he's actually elected pontifus Max maximus actually we've, we've actually just missed this point not that it really matters per se although it matters insofar that eventually he um he puts up um one of his own to become Potifix when he's um later dictator, I'm pretty sure. But um, yes, it's but, Augustus, the Octavian. Yeah, it's like, it is Octavian, okay, it is, yeah, yeah. I just couldn't I just went blank for a second. But yeah, it is Octavian. Um but Caesar basically departs his house, his residence, and he turns to his mother and he says, By this evening I will return home a priest or a pauper. Because his position of what Pontifex Maximus came with a, a, a pretty impressive salary. It came with his own domicile. He would, you know, he had a he would have a house in Rome with you know high walls, close proximity to the forum, which as a populist was perfectly suitable for Caesar. Um, but he invested so much money. I'm talking like borrowed to the last sesterci to entertain and to corral and to convince people. And you know that that thing we talked about earlier about his lavish parties and whatever. He had spent every last coin he had to win that election and he did and there's many many instances in caesar's life where he just scrapes through his election as pontifex maximus is one of them and we'll see often in his military career caesar is a sword stroke or a coin flip away from disaster but caesar somehow you know prevails even if he loses tactically or he or he has a setback or gets a bloody nose caesar always finds a way to win um, and 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 the Pontifex Maximus thing is the first real example of that sort of, you know, um, on the cusp. You know, it could go either way, but yet Caesar wins. It it, it it sort of sets a trend for his life. Well, it's also important because the Pontifex Maximus was an, an ancient office. You know, it's the high priest of Rome, and it's you know the very ancient origins of the you know 
the, the, the Catholic Church's Pope, you know, um, pontiff that comes from the Pontifex Maxima. So it's this incredibly important position, yeah. which yeah. had been held, I think it's actually been held originally, though it may not have been held by it, but point is when Rome was a kingdom, the kings of Rome were the high priests and were responsible for all the religious processions. So already you can see um, kingly aspirations, maybe, um, you could say. Indeed. And Caesar famously replies, I'm not king, but Caesar. But that's later in the story. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, after that uh, happens, um, he then, uh, he's made the proconsul, I believe, of its um, Cisalpine Gaul, which is um, modern northern Italy, um, but also Illyria, which is um, Croatia, and that coast a bit of... of, of the, the Dalmatian coast, the Adriatic coast of the of Yugoslavia, or former Yugoslavia, yeah. Yes, and also Transalpine Gaul, which is the mm. um, small bit of southwestern uh, France which um, mm. the Romans held. And then from there, he masses the mm. money and resources to embark on his conquest mm. of Gaul, which mm. takes place over several years, um, sees many... Did, did, um, just before we proceed, can I just add just a tiny bit of context here for me? Sure. Um, yeah, so, so Southpine Gaul basically corresponds with what the Italians call one day Transpadana, which is like the sort of the Badana sort of what they call that Po Valley region. And like you say, Transalpine Gaul is sort of Mediterranean France, um, basically coinciding with Monday Toulouse and Provence and um and also Savoy to some extent. Um but each it's important to know that each because so, at this point this is just post Marian reforms, right? Like this <laughs> is the point where, where Rome has a standing army of of volunteer legionnaires. And this is arguably at the point where maybe not in terms of raw sort of equipment quality or even um necessarily tactics but the fighting man in rome at this point is impressive he, he is a soldier that can withstand and can do so much it's he, he's he, he's really kind of a in i hate to sort of say this you know because i don't want to sort of overstated but but he's almost sort of like a super soldier insofar that you know you know he's legionnaires are um are not only warriors and trained grizzled drained uh trained soldiers are to quote josephus actually i mean josephus is you know a couple of centuries later but josephus says that you know the romans um their their drills are bloodless battles and their battles are bloody drills you know they fight with wooden shields and swords that are heavier than their mental counterparts so that in battle they have greater endurance these are men who must march 30 miles a day build a fort before sunset entrench that fort you know get the meals ready build the latrines do their you know ablutions you know water bathe tend to wounds etc and then sleep change the guard get up in the morning disassemble the camp march another 30 miles and do the same thing again like these are people these are men of phenomenal physical strength and endurance and as we see in, in many of rome's campaigns of great courage of great tenacity and fighting potential and caesar's in a huge exemplar of this in, in gaul we will see very soon um so so the roman fighting man is at this sort of ep this epigee and each province comes with two legions and caesar uh when he was pr a prefect in spain actually if i if i've because uh, there's a book uh, called um caesar's legion by stephen dando collins and again it's another book i recommend if you love caesar and you're interested in this sort of early empire, late Republic Roman legion and the fighting and the battles involved. Fantastic book. Um, I believe Caesar raises the raises the 10th in Spain while he's um, a prefect there or, you know, quest or whatever his rank is. Um, and so these men are already familiar with him. And there so happens that the 10th and I believe the ninth, maybe, or the 13th, I can't remember which other legion, because there's I think two or three Spanish legions or they're raised in Spain, in Roman Spain. And they're actually coincidentally with him. They're in the provinces that he gains the pre prefect prefectorship of. Um, so between Illyricum and Trans uh, Alpine Gaul and Trans Trans Alpine Gaul, he has a, he already has an army of six legions. It makes him, ironically, the most powerful man in Rome at this point. Actually, you know, on paper, makes him slightly more powerful than Pompey, who can rally an army at a, at a, at, a, at you know. Like he says in the HBO's Rome, all I have to do is stamp my foot and legions will ra pop up all over Italy. But he doesn't actually have them on hand. What Caesar do does have is six legions, three of them battle-hardened already at his disposal. 
Yes, it's certainly a, a very militarily um, strong um, p position um, to like, launch a, um, a conquest because I think it's fair to say that before the conquest of Gaul, I don't think there's any single Roman campaign that um, conquered so much territory in um, or, or of that scale. Would you agree? Uh, certainly in terms of a single protracted campaign over like a, a specific geographical area, yes. Um you, you got to think, uh, with the exception of that stretch of Transalpine Gaul, which is a part of the Republic, and for Rome, uh, there is Romanization occurring there, but really it's kind of, they took over the role of what Marseille and Emporia, Emporia being relatively close to modern-day Girona, which is sort of north, like extreme northwestern Spain, right on the right on the coast of France, um, and then Marseille, which, as we know, was a founded as a Greek city. In fact, at this point in time, the majority of the vast majority of people in Marseille are actually Greek speaking. They're still ethnic Greeks. Um, but Rome takes over this takes over this sort of position that the Greeks did of you know dealing with the Gallic tribes, their trade ports, and they you know people buying slaves and selling slaves, and they're buying goods and trading. And you know, and for Rome, it's a, it's actually a land bridge. They considered Hispania more valuable and more important. Transalpine Gaul has served as a place to build a road, you know, a cobblestone road with some watchtowers and forts, and the Romans could traverse to Spain without having to always use their ships because Romans were notoriously not fond of being on the sea. Um, so this is the, the point of Transalpine Gaul. So if you just take that away, Caesar's campaign basically absorbs the entirety of modern-day France, basically the entirety of modern-day Belgium, modern-day Flanders, south of the Rhine, south and east, uh, west of the Rhine, and parts of modern-day Germany in, in one, you know, what is it, a five, six-year campaign that, or seven-year campaign, however long he's fighting in, in Gaul. Um, he does it in one go, and all those tribes once... Uh, without again ruining for a spoiler, once the crescendo is dealt with, um, you know, with Vercingetorix, um, all of that territory becomes a part of the Roman sphere and essentially permanently. Um, yes, and um, it's also, I think, one of the most brutal campaigns in history because um, uh, Plutarch literally says, I think it's um, one million um, Gauls are dead by the end and another million are enslaved, and um, that's about half the population basically. So it's um, almost genocidal in, in some respects would you agree i i dare say the outcome would have been slightly different were it not for and i'm not saying it's the blame versus getterix like you know like a man has a right to defend his his patrimony and his homeland like i'm not saying this as a, as a victim claiming exercise but just in the context of discussing this point i think this is made all the more worse by that revolt by versus and, mm -hmm. and the fact that you know obviously in the aftermath of the revolt, there's pacification campaigns and someone in Caesar's position with a, with an occupying force doesn't want to have to deal with constant uprisings and the Romans being the Romans. I mean, these are the people who famously disassembled Carthage to the last stone. These are the people who tore down Corinth brick by brick. These are the people who <laughs> crucified the entirety of Spartacus's army on the Appian way. Like Romans don't, half measure with revolts if you actually consider the fate of those two cities the treatment of gaul was kind of lenient in some ways it's still in our modern historical context looking back we still can't call it, it we would still consider it a human tragedy and and you know use the word genocide um it, it could be categorized as that it's certainly a brutal brutal campaign and uh and from a cultural standpoint it's a terrible tragedy for the gallic people who even though we use terms historically we say gallo-roman and to some degree the modern french people are sort of this this fusion and metamorphosis of gallic roman influences and later german influences because as we know the franks were a german tri tribe um but this gallic heart this origin this this sort of ethnogenesis of the gallic people does vanish with romanization so that's sort of quite a tragedy in its own right well, speaking of genocide, you I think you neglected to mention um, the Italian Vespers when Mithridates, like, was it 50,000 um, Roman and Italian people are massacred in Asia Minor? And, um, oh, Roman it's more. It's, it's, in the, it's, it's, it's in the hundreds of thousands. Is that, that's actually, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, you know, because I remember I was re reading a book about Mithridates some years ago, and that's when I first discovered that happened, and I was speechless. I was like, are you stupid? Because they're going to wipe you out for that. 
of all the people's wrath to incur, the the Roman Republic was <laughs> the, arguably the worst uh, entity you could rile. Uh, you know, and, and to and to um, uh, just give me a second. I, I just because we're on the on the subject, because I mean, I, I know most of people in our circles know this, and I'm kind of you know tearing over hashed ground. But to quote Herennius of of the Samnites when he consulted his father Pontius about how to deal with the Romans after the Battle of the Cordine Forks, where the Samnite army sort of trap and surround the Romans. And Herennius asked his father, well, what do I do? I've, I've actually unexpectedly won against the Romans. How do I deal with them? You know, do I you know, humiliate them? Do I, you know, decimate them? And when I say decimate, I mean the literal kill one in 10 decimation, not the stupid modern day usage of decimation. Um, you know, do I let them go? And his father said, either treat them lightly and let them go or kill them all. There's no point just pricking the Romans. And this is the quote that Herennius uses. The Romans are a nation who know not how to remain quiet under defeat. Whatever disgrace this present extremity burns into their souls will rankle there forever and will allow, allow them no rest until they have made you pay for it many times over. And what they what happened the fate of Mithridates really is that summed up. <laughs> yes, you know, having to flee to your, your son's kingdom and then, you know, pathetically trying to like commit suicide and you can't because you've made yourself immune to poison. Mm. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so well with the Gaulic campaign, um so you have the initial sort of conquest where he pacifies it, he then goes off and does a little um side mission um, to Britain where he has a bit of a skirmish, does a little bit of trade, and then his, his, in his absence is when the rebellion sort of is born because he's, because he's taking troops away mm. and some of the, um, the, the the garrisons are left vulnerable and there's this sort of um, ruse where um, I think this Celtic tribe comes to attack one of the frontier towns and they then they call it off and they say to the Romans well, um Sorry, we, we attacked you. Um, th these other tribes, they, they're, they're coming. There's a huge horde of them. If you don't leave now, you're going to get massacred. So, so the Romans leave, and then they all get ambushed because they're out the fort. And um, it's a massive setback. And then he spends ages trying to um, <clears throat> essentially um, re reconquer Gaul after that ha ha happens. Mm. So it's, um, it's worth just mentioning very briefly that Caesar does make two attempted landings on, Brit on Britannia. Um, there's actually two landings, one, I think about 18 months apart. Um, and basically what he ends up doing is because he knows he can't really hold the territory, particularly in the second campaign where he knows there's rumblings in Gaul. The first campaign, there's not so much of that. But in the second landing, there is already rumblings in Gaul. And Caesar knows that he can't militarily commit to keeping troops in Britannia. So he just sort of, you know, attacks um, the the tribes that have, um, you know, sent hosts against him you know in dover he penetrates a little bit inland he destroys a couple of what would you call Brit brythonic opida you know like they're sort of hill forts um he builds a monument on the coast and then leaves and like you say by the time caesar does return to gaul um at, and there's one instance actually where caesar uh, caesar's uh, ships uh, some of them are scattered on uh, as a result of a storm on the way back and some of Caesar's troops are actually cut off um, further up the coast, like, you know, what he's in sort of Monday Flanders, you know, on the to the east of the Pas de Calais. And these troops are forced to sort of fight in an orb, what the Romans call an audible, you know, an outward facing circle. And Caesar actually catches wind of this, uh, one of his scouts reports, and Caesar actually leads his cavalry force of a couple of hundred um, Roman cavalry and breaks this um ambush against the romans you got to think like he's the kind of man who and he demonstrates this again and again and again you know i mean we've we've kind of just we haven't even really spoken about the battles in gaul per se to to, to gain victory but you know he he wins these battles like Brabracte, he totally outmaneuvers the the helvetii and then just defeats them in detail and it's like the first time that his legions are bloodied and it's like a four-hour battle it's it's certainly not um it's not a light affair that first battle of Brabracte, but um you know, he, he and then very famously, I've spoken about the Battle of Ribasabas. I think it was the second stream I did with Apostolic Majesty. You know, and um, a part of his army is actually ambushed. Um, and uh, and one legion, um, I want to say it's the maybe the ninth or the or the twelfth legion. Can't remember which one exactly. But the, the this 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 legion is so heavily pressed at the Battle of Ribasabas that's. The Nervii, who are like they considered the most ferocious of the Gauls, 
And there's actually a line about the nervy guy in, in Caesar's um, commentaries. I might just cite it before we leave Gaul as a topic. But this legion is actually bent onto an L shape or like sort of like a wide U shape. And all of their centurions are killed except for their prima pilus, which is their chief centurion. And this centri and, and Caesar actually writes about this centurion because um, he writes about a few people in his commentaries. There's about four of them we know by name. One of them is Baculus. Um, because the other two famously based upon like HBO's Rome, like we know obviously Varinus and Pullo, they're sort of characters that Caesar writes in his commentaries. And obviously they embellish the storyline for the show. But again, they're two centurions mentioned in Caesar's commentaries. Now this centurion Baculus, he's so wounded. He has so many major and minor wounds that he can't stand. He can't hold his sword. With his one good arm, he's holding the eagle because the aquifer's dead. <laughs> Everybody in command in this legion is dead. But the troops keep fighting. The minor officers, you know, the, the junior officers and Baculus keep this legion intact, despite the fact they've been, you know, over the course of an hour, really almost surrounded. And Caesar marches at the head of the vanguard of the reinforcements, and he eventually sends Labienus over with the 10th Legion, which is Caesar's favorite legion. You see the 10th pop up time and time again. They actually counterattack. They manage to push the Gauls back far enough so they can throw their pillar, and they push them into the river, hence the River Sabis. They break this other tribe. I actually can't remember who this other tribe is. A name escapes me just for the moment. Um, and then the 10th sort of raid the camp, and then Caesar sends a messenger to Labienus to relieve this legion that's under pressure and Labiena sends half of the soldiers back to sort of flank the Nervii and the Nervii almost killed to a man. And Caesar actually writes in his commentaries that the Nervii are the, the finest warriors he's ever faced. He actually almost sheds a tear because of the courage. Like they just, they don't relent their attack. None of them surrender. Um, and it's interesting that Caesar sort of expressly writes this, you know, like often, I mean, sometimes there's embellishment to sort of make his own troops look good, but at the same time, it is refreshing when writers in history actually speak admirably of of heroic figures who are their opponents. And Caesar writes this about the Nervii, and, and the Nervii, probably one tribe he writes, certainly pre Vercingetorix, writes about with the most, um, you know, like esteem, you might say. Um, yes, but it's always. You know, you know, you're right because, um, well, it's a sense of honor and respect because you know you're both uh, um, engaged in in battle, battle, and it's just respect for, for for your enemies. You fight the good fight, so to speak. Indeed. And actually, while I was talking about, you know, you're talking about that um soldier sort of standing there holding the eagle and um Baculus. You know, <laughs> Baculus. Well, there's actually a little bit from Plutarch where he talks about the sort of devotion. Uh, soldiers have towards Caesar and what they're prepared to do. So this is quite short. So, so great were the goodwill and devotion of Caesar's soldiers to him that those who under other generals were in no way superior to ordinary soldiers were invincible and irresistible and ready to meet any danger for Caesar's glory. An instance of this is Asilius, who in the sea fight of Massilia um, boarded one of the enemy ships and had his right hand cut off with a sword, but he still kept hold of his shield with the left hand and striking at the faces of the enemy drove all to flight and got possession of the vessel. Another instance was um, Cassius Scaver, who in the flight at Dyrrhachium had one eye destroyed by an arrow, his shoulder transfixed with one javelin and his thigh with another, and on his shield he had received the blows of 130 missiles. In this, this flight he called to the enemy as if he designed to surrender himself, and two of them accordingly approached him. But with his sword he lopped off one man's shoulder and wounding the other in the face, put him to flight. And he finally, he escaped himself with the aid of his friends. In Britannia, on one occasion, the natives had attacked the foremost centurions who had got into a marshy spot full of water, upon which, in the presence of Caesar, who was viewing the contest, a soldier rushed into the midst of the enemy, and after performing many conspicuous acts of valour, rescued the centurions from the barbarians who took the flight. The soldier, with difficulty attempting to cross after all the rest, plunged into the muddy stream, and with great trouble and the loss of his shield, sometimes swimming, sometimes walking, he got safe over. While those who were about Caesar were admiring his conduct and coming to receive him with congratulations and shouts, the soldier, with the greatest marks of dejection and tears in his eyes, fell down at Caesar's feet and begged pardon for the loss of his shield. Again, in Libya, Scipio's party having taken one of Caesar's ships in which was Granius Petro, 
who had been appointed questor, made booty of all the rest, but offered to give the questor his life. But he, replying that it was the fashion of Caesar's soldiers to give and not to accept mercy, killed himself with his own sword. And that's the uh, end of the section. So you can see these soldiers mm. just absolutely were fanatically uh, devoted to, to Caesar, and nothing could could stir mm. them from their, their conviction. Hmm. Exactly. And, and there's something. Just if I, if I might go back to the sabers, I, I, I won't read. I, I don't say I could read half the chapter, but I will not read it. A to not make the stream because of what. I, thanks to my tangents, it's going to be far longer than I'm sure you intended. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you know, we have much yet to cover, but I will read just a couple of excerpts from this Stephen Dando Collins book, uh, Caesar's Legion, because it does touch as to the um, as to the gravity of the situation. And also there's this thing that Caesar does. He does it, does it famously at Munda, which is which puts an end to the um, to the to the civil war. He does this at um, I believe he does this where might occur at Pharsalus. I can't remember exactly. Um, he it, it definitely happens in the Nile campaign, you know, when he's sort of dealing with the the, the Ptolemies and and uh, young Ptolemy and Cleopatra and et cetera, et cetera. But Caesar has this knack of, you know, he'll snatch a shield at the at the moment of crisis in battle, and he yells out the name of every centurion, and he you know he he shouts acknowledgement and and um encouragement to all the troops and they'll roar you know in sort of adoration and and they'll redouble their efforts and they find you know this, this second wind and and um and caesar's unafraid to to be in the thick of the fighting and um actually very famously at monday he said you know there are many many times i have fought for victory this is the one time i fought for my life <laughs> because actually famously at Munda, i mean we'll get there but at Munda, he um he's actually targeted by a labianus and he uh, essentially a, a, an almost an entire century throw their peeler in his general direction and he has to throw away his shield because he has like half a dozen javelins peeler sticking out of it and he's not and he's not even wounded um so caesar has this knack of sort of you know picking up the shield and ra charging through his own army and rallying his troops and and this is why his legions particularly the you know the seventh the tenth thirteenth is just they would they would literally you know march to to tartarus and back for him that there's nothing they won't do um but these couple of excerpts if i may um yeah, certainly. so so i was talking about um the gravity of um of the situation um at uh at uh at, at the at the river sabers um so i'm just trying to find where i was, I was uh, starting with um i hate when your mark falls away um oh here we go on the roman right wing the seventh and twelfth legions had been all but surrounded by the uh by the uh by the nervii and their king here, the Roman disorder, particularly amongst the men of the less experienced 12th Legion, most of whose centurions had already died, oh, sorry, were already dead or wounded, threatened to give way um, in the face of this onslaught and in order to be defeated. The Legion's fourth cohort, which had taken the brunt of the Nervian attack, had lost every centurion and a standard bearer. Caesar arrived on the scene to find the men assembled behind any standard and packed tightly in their fear. Caesar dismounted and grabbed the shield from a man in the rear then made his way to the forefront of the battle, yelling orders, push forward, spread out, give yourselves rooms to fight. He addressed the surviving centurions all by name, urging them and their men onwards. Given new heart by the arrival of their general, the men of the 12th rallied, seeing the 7th legion close by, similarly hard-pressed. Caesar shouted to their uh, tribunes and centurions also, ordering, the, ordering, the, ordering, the, sorry, ordering them to link up with the 12th and to form one large square, in order that they may have a contiguous line that the Nervii could not break. As this formation was created, the Nervii and their king were held back, but Caesar and the two legions were still being pressed by compact lines on all three sides and about to be surrounded. And then this is the bit where sort of Labienus charges across the Sabis and routes um, this other tribe, um, the Atrobates, that's right, I, I forgot who it was. It was the Atrobates. Um and uh and yeah you know caesar um often does this um well not so often it happens a few times um in his campaigns uh, many many generals um 
I suppose, you know, there's all, in, in antiquity, you have characters, you know, like Parmenio, like Alexander, like Pyrrhus, like Antigonus and Antiochus, the great um, Pompey, even, especially in his younger days, um, Scipio Flaminatus. These are men who do fight alongside their men. But there are other generals who aren't so predisposed to fighting amongst their men. Actually, funnily enough, Gaius Myris is one of them. He preferred to sort of command from the rear and give orders. Uh, but Caesar you know time and again does this and he often sort of saves his own bacon by doing it for instance at sabas had he not um had he not actually sort of rallied the 12th and the 7th his entire right wing would have broken and had the nervii got into the camp and then you know hit the flank of the legions in the center which i believe would have been the eighth um i can't remember what the other legion was but the eighth was in the center uh, you know, Caesar could have arguably had half his army routed and the 10th would have been isolated in the enemy camp and the Roman baggage train would have been captured. So, you know, he was a hair away from disaster, but his heroism and his leadership won the day. Um, yes, but it's always important for a leader to sort of thrust, thrust yourself into the presence of your men because them actually seeing you is, um, inspires courage. And... And, and also, too, like not just to say, oh, you men. You know, like, for instance, if you sort of like watch a, a movie like Band of Brothers or something or, you know, Saving Private Ryan, like often, you know, leaders that are sort of above the rank, I don't know, like Colonel or whatever, will sort of not know many people by name. You know, Caesar is a consul and he's the he's the he's the governor he's a provincial governor, yet he knows every centurion's name and can call them out in the middle of the battle like Caesar's. I mean, he's he, he's basically a polymath as well. It must be said the guy is a borderline genius, but. You know, he's also got this sort of this martial spirit. He sort of unifies these two natures together in one person. Um, you know, and, and the fact that you know, if you're in a battle and you're fighting for your life, and many of your comrades and your officers are dead, to hear your general actually address you by name specifically, you know, oh Titus, oh um, you know Marcus or Antonius or or um, you know whatever, you know uh, Fabius, you know spread your formation out, you know, fight for your, um, your general, you know, keep the eagle, you know, keep the enemy at bay, you know, gain order, push on, you know, that kind of encouragement is, um, you know, it, it's, it's what Napoleon would call the intangibles of battle. You know, it's like, you can't actually weigh that. You can't quantify it, but those kind of things are often the difference between victory and defeat or indeed life or death. Um, yes, just to interrupt you, but again, my mind again goes back to HBO's Rome. There's that moment where um, the Senate have declared him an enemy and he has to march on, on Italy and he does the speech to the 13th Legion and um, he calls out, he's like, can the injury Titus Pullo step forward? And so Pullo steps forward and then he says, Titus Pullo, will you, will you follow me and against my enemies at the Senate? And he's like, yes. And then all the rest of the soldiers join in and he, he asks them, so again, with the whole knowing the individual soldiers' names. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 it pays its own dividend. You know, soldiers feel valuable um, when their general knows them, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, okay, so was there any more you wanted to read from... Um... Uh, no, I'll, I'll put Dando Collins away for now because otherwise we'll be here okay. for like several hours. So <laughs> <laughs> let's continue. <laughs> Because um, yeah, because because the thing is, Vercingetorix and Elysia will probably take up a bit of time too. So, you know, mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. So on that basis, it's probably better. So to go back to the troubles that lead to the breakdown of the um, first triumvirate and the breakout of civil war. So during the campaign, Caesar has to return to Italy, and um, he meets with um, Pompey and Crassus at um, Lucca, um, where they renew the triumvirate. Um, and then they they carry on, and then two events happen which shatter it. Um, one is Crassus dying at the Battle of Carre um, against the Parthians, and also it's um, Julius Caesar's daughter uh, dies in childbirth, um, and so again breaking the marriage link between him and Pompey, and um, and <clears throat> so the the breaking of these two links and the strained relations between Caesar and the Senate. Is ultimately uh, leads to civil war because um, to sort of touch on this, so obviously with Crassus dead, um, Caesar and Pompey are the two most powerful men in the Republic. Um, you know they've both got support of a large portion of the Roman legions, uh, so mm. it's worth mentioning too that these events 
Carre and Julia's death in childbirth both occur quite close together and they both occur in the almost immediate aftermath of Elysia. Um, because we mentioned this sort of uprising that was occurring when Caesar was partaking in his second invasion of, of Britannia, or rather, it was sort of taking motion when Caesar makes his second landing, comes back to Gaul. And then by the time um, he reunites with Labienus, um, I believe in Lutetia, which is Monday Paris or somewhere in that vicinity, by that point, the Gauls have announced Vercingetorix as their unified king, and there's a general uprising um, throughout Gaul. Basically, most of the tribes, even some of Rome's, um, take, for example, the Aedui under Divitiacus, join this rebellion. So even the, the Gauls that have been closest to Roman. I mean, the Aedui have been allies with Rome from the beginning of the actual Gallic conflict from, you know, the because um, it was the Aedui who needed assistance against the Helvetii, who were the invading tribe of Bibracto. Um Even the Aedui join this uprising. And we can probably estimate that Caesar probably embellishes the numbers somewhat. He basically says 80,000 men in the Opida with, um, with Vercingetorix and the relieving army is 250,000. But let's even say if you halve both, there's 40,000 in the Opida, and let's just say there's 100, 120,000, even if it's 80,000, that's a relief army. Caesar only has 35 to 40,000 fighting men. Um, and we probably should talk about Legion because the is one of the greatest siege battles of all time. The fact that Caesar is besieging a force larger than his own and then fights an invasion force, and he does it by building a circumvallation around the city that is, oh, I want to say, um, Oh, something order of like 17, like 12 kilometers or something. It's huge. And then the outer wall, which is the uh, contravallation, is about is 15 kilometers. It's huge. It, 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 very long. And there's there's watchtowers and there's you know ballistae mounted on the walls and and there's palisades and spikes and ditches and caltrops and moats and like, there's all you know as the Romans do siege craft is their thing. Um, and then there's this guy, this massive three, four day battle that rages outside of Elysia. Um, and there's actually quite a bit of um, callousness demonstrated by Caesar in that after the first, I think it's like the first day of fighting, Vercingetorix forces this, the Gallic citizens out of the, out of the Opida because they can't afford to feed the army and the people. In fact, even Vercingetorix's troops are, are starving at this point. And the people... Caesar callously rejects any proposal to evacuate them or to let them pass through the lines, and they're forced to eat grass between Caesar's walls and the city walls, and many of them, if not most of them, perish. It's a very ghastly affair. Um, but Caesar, again, demonstrates his fighting quality. This is also the first time we really see Mark Antony making a note of himself. Um, he leads one of the relief attempts um, around the walls, uh, and it's particularly day two and day three where Caesar's really pressed because there's instances where um, Vercingetorix and the relieving army attack different parts of the wall and then they take this attack the same part of the wall together and then Vercingetorix will split his army that then attack two parts and the and then the outside force sort of attack all the walls at once and there's many of these kind of diametrically you know ongoing battles at one time or sort of in, in synchronization with each other or they might be you know in um was what i'm looking for um you know like sort of one happens like they're sequenced they're sort of sequentially sort of occurring battles and you, you read so many times and dando collins writes it very well um and there's other books that write about this too but you sort of hear these instances again you know the the legions at this gate were hard pressed and you know every man was fighting for himself and caesar you know he, he'd go along the wall and you know pick you know five out of six soldiers off the wall and then he'd go to the to the to the to the tent where like the wounded soldiers are and anyone that could hold a weapon was you know collected together and caesar would scrape together you know half a cohort and he'd relieve the walls or he'd relieve the gatehouse or he'd you know he'd, he'd have his troops withdrawn he hit them on the goals on the flank you know uh, you know scraping together all these last reserves of troops that he has scattered along the, his fortifications and he holds the line and then famously on the last day, he um, he has this ace up his, up his sleeve whereby he recruits um, a few thousand German cavalry um, from across the Rhine, and they have not been committed into the battle. In fact, the Gauls don't even know this cavalry reserve even exists. And at the point of contact where the, the mass of the outer Gauls are actually pressed against Caesar's fortifications, Caesar 
gives the the signal for the German cavalry to sort of plow down the hill, and they just and then by this stage the Gauls are tired and frustrated and have been thwarted by the Romans at every chat at every opportunity to like try and breach the walls, and the Gauls break, and then when the Gauls inside the Opera under Vercingetorix know that the Romans have um have broken, they lose heart and give up the fight. After which Vercingetorix surrenders. And we we all have to know that famous scene in HBO Rome where they sort of thrust the eagle in Vercingetorix's face and they strip him naked and he's made to kiss the eagle. Um Vercingetorix is quite the hero of the Gallic people, but his fate seals the fate of Gaul and Caesar after this remarkable, even a magnificent battle, becomes the great man of Rome. He actually displaces Pompey, you might say, after Elysia. So it's worth probably quantifying that this is what actually almost to some degree between the death of Julia, the death of Crassus, and Caesar's success in Gaul and this this remarkable victory, this great victory, um, this triumph essentially at Elysia. Pompey is now number two to Caesar in the Roman sort of hierarchy and sees as the popular support, and now he has no debt problems. Now he's actually a wealthy man, and he's got an experienced battle-hardened army at his disposal. Um, he becomes a very dangerous figure for the Senate. Yes, and um, I mean, fundamentally, I think um, Pompey probably had more to gain by opposing Caesar than trying to still work with him, because, yeah, as you're right, he'd been, he'd been outshined, um, essentially, and... Um, there's another passage from Plutarch that I want to read about the, um, the sort of the breakdown of the um, triumvirate. So Caesar had long sure, ago let's, resolved let's have it. to put yeah Caesar long ago resolved to put down Pompeius as Pompeius also had fully resolved to do towards him. But now that Crassus had lost his life among the Parthians, who kept a watch over both of them, it remains for one of them in order to be the chief to put down him who was and to him who was the chief to take off the man whom he feared, in order that this might not befall him. It had only recently occurred to Pompeius to take alarm, and hitherto he had despised Caesar, thinking it would be no difficult thing for the man whom he had elevated to be again depressed by him. But Caesar, who had formed his design from the beginning, like an athlete, removed himself to a distance from his antagonists and exercised himself in the Celtic Wars, and thus disciplined his troops and increased his reputation, being elevated by his exploits to a equality with the victories of Pompeius, also laying hold of pretexts some furnished by the conduct of Pompeius himself, and others by the times and the disordered state of the administration at Rome, owing to which those who were candidates for magistracies placed tables in public and shamelessly bribed the masses, and the people being hired went down to show their part partisanship, not with votes on behalf of their briber, but with bows and swords and slings, and after polluting the roster of blood and dead bodies, they separated, leaving the city to anarchy, like a ship carried along without a pilot, so that sensible men were well content if matters should result in nothing worse than a monarchy after such madness and such tempest. And there were many who had ventured to say publicly that the state of affairs could only be remedied by a monarchy, and that ought to submit to this remedy when applied by the mildest of physicians hinting at Pompeius. But when Pompeius, in what he said, affected to decline the honour, though in fact he was more than anything else, labouring to bring about his appointment as dictator, Cato, who saw through his intention, persuaded the Senate to appoint him sole consul, that he might not by violent means get himself made dictator, and might be contented with a mere constitutional monarchy. They also decreed an additional period for his provinces, and he had two, Iberia and all Libya, which he administered by sending legati and maintaining armies, for which he received out of the public treasury a thousand talents every year. So essentially, Plutarch is saying that um, Pompey was conspiring to be be made the dictator of Rome, uh, though maybe for less, um, shall we say, violent or obvious means, as say Sulla had once before. Hmm. Yeah. Well, this is the thing too. Like, it was getting to the point where I think. Uh, I mean, a lot of people have over the eons talked about this over time, but I think there's this point where a republic of any kind becomes successful, whether it's financially successful, economically successful, militarily successful, um, whatever metric or the measurement you wish to utilize, be tangible, even intangible. It gets to the point where it just, it is forced to atrophy. You know, there's so many forces sort of, 
pulling at the at the sort of the flesh and bones of of the republic that it's sort of eventually torn asunder and you know really rome we already see it in the aftermath of the punic war where sort of scipio has this un uh what do you call this uneasy relationship with the senate you know eventually you know he he prevails in africa they you know he's called scipio africanus because of his victory over hannibal and the battle of zama um, but then he sort of shoveled off the side because people don't want to, you know, another another Tarquinus to rise, even though Scipio was certainly not of that temperament in my by, by my estimation. But then, you know, when you have the great troubles in the East and the Macedonian Wars, well, of course, they call up the old man Scipio to sort of address Rome's great enemies to the East. And he goes back to the fore and alongside Flaminius, Flaminanus commands the army in Greece. And puts down the you know the the Macedonians and the sort of rebellious Aetolians and the other Greeks that are causing trouble, um, and there's already a hint of senatorial forces you might say at play. Sort of you know f- f- the the factions kind of creating divisions that will eventually turn a crack into an abyss or a crevasse. You know, um, and it comes to light with the with the the, the I say the deaths, but you could call them the the assassinations, the murders of the brothers Gracchi, um, you know, before this time. And really, it's the war between Sulla and Marius that really puts the, the, the Republic on borrowed time. People know that if they have soldiers at their disposal, that they can march on Rome and defeat the, the, the body politic. They can defeat the Senate. They can defeat the Roman state. Um and ultimately, once people have that realization, the pot, the, the 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 game of power politics becomes playing for keeps, and there's no you know there's no medals for second place in that regard. Um, and to some degree, probably Caesar knows this, and Pompey knows this, and actually had Crassus survived, maybe the triumvirate might have lived on. But as we see later on, I mean, another episode, different people, but we see this with Lepidus mark antony and octavian like ultimately rome's only so big enough for one of them and so we see the breakdown of the second trial for it the point i'm making is that we already see these these fatal cracks appearing in the 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 republic in the roman republic in the in the administrative government that they sort of conceived of it, you know it served rome as a city state arguably even as a regional power but once rome really became an empire at all but name where it sort of has these holdings in hispania in asia minor in syria you know in north africa and these provinces require governors and these governors require troops to maintain frontiers and internal order well can this system outlive um you know powerful military dispositions in the provinces and you know uh, uh, uh human governors with foibles and the answer we now know is no it doesn't um but it's a wonderful insight into sort of the the dilapidation of of that system and this is where uh, i'm sorry to digress hit man um but this is where I, when people sort of say oh it's, this is a repeat of the fall of rome it's like well firstly do you mean rome or byzantium because there's two different sets of circumstances right but if we just talk about west rome the, you know, the latin latin old rome right are you talking about the fall of the empire or the republic? Because they're two very, very different things. Rome continues to be a powerful state long after this period. But what we see here is the breaking down of the system, not necessarily the, the nation, if you get what I mean. But what does happen in this time period is that the system that Rome has conceived of many centuries in its past ceases to function. And actually, sort of once it starts unraveling and sort of you know fraying at the, at the fringes, it does collapse in a relatively short space of time. No, absolutely, because I think with the, with, as with anything, early in Rome, you had a very strong particularist tendencies. You know, men wanted to fight and die for the glory of Rome, but it, in the end, it just became wanting to um, just acquire as much wealth and power as possible. Sort of the, the creep, creeping nihilism, which um, sort of corrupts everything. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and also you know, like in the end, you get rather than it sort of being this civic duty and this sort of you know, um, I'm always I'm always reminded a lot of people don't actually know the context of this. You know, if you watch Gladiator the movie, right, and 
Richard Harris, who plays um, Marcus Aurelius, <clears throat> he makes this remark, and it has always stuck with me because I sort of have always got the context of it, or at least this is my interpretation of the context I think I've gotten from it, where he says to Maximus, which is obviously the Russell Crowe character, he says, you know, there was once a time where Rome was, you know, was anything more than a whisper and it vanish, basically implying that, you know, Rome was just this sort of collection of little insignificant villages on a few hilltops along the river Tiber that were no more than just farming villages, you know, and there was, you know, some oxen and some goats and, you know, a, a few, a few little palisades and that's all Rome was. And a, a harsh winter could have killed it quite literally, but Rome would become this sort of great burgeoning empire with that had very humble origins. Um, and the Roman Republic was found within a very specific context of a city state with proximal enemies, you know, the, with the Etruscans and the Sabines and you know, the Samnites and the, and the, even Rome even fought the Latin League at the beginning, and, you know, the Volsci and the Arunzi and all these people of, 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 of southern modern day Lazio and northern Campania who fought against Rome for a time. Um, but that system couldn't be extrapolated much past continental Italy. You know, like I said, once it became an empire in all but name, this republic that worked and served the purpose for a group of people of a particular of a particular disposition and frame of mind, dare I call it a biospirit, you know, to use um, you know, a bapism, um, didn't work when it became a domain that had imperial possessions. Um and, and and I think like because obviously this is a stream about Julius Caesar's life and also Caesarism. This is a really really fundamental part of Caesarism, and this is where a lot of people who talk about Caesarism I don't think have read much not only about Caesar, but don't understand or perhaps don't have enough perspective of the Roman system and where it came from, what its genesis was. You know, it's 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 it's, it's start point. It's you know it's it's alpha to use a, like make, use the Greekism. Um, uh, you know, it's the the context of any founding thing matters as to what it is why it exists and perhaps ascertaining what its limitations are and i think we see this very much with the roman senate and this is where the parallels with say modern day the united states which again empire in all but name these comparisons ring true and you have to ask yourself is it the dissolution of the country as in west wre you know circa attila and valentinian and honorius or is it the collapse of the merely the system, which is the first and second triumvirate, Caesar, Pompey, Augustus, the liberators, etc.? So I, I, I'm sorry I'm digressing on you here, man, but I just think that was a really important point to canvas because often it's lost in the in the you know the, the the huff and puff of talk of Caesarism in in internet circles. Um, no, that, thank you for that, Marcus. Uh, no, I think that, that was wonderful. And um, while we're talking about America and Rome. Um, I actually think of America is kind of at the um, the Roman Empire stage. I think it's going to last a, a good while. Um, so, and in fact, one of the reasons I think this is um, I know it's sort of an interesting parallel because you know with the um, with the empire you have um, obviously the imperial provinces and the uh, the senatorial provinces. The senatorial being the um, the sort of the core like Italy, Greece, um, a bit of Spain as well. And then you've got all the frontier, so like in Egypt, Gaul, Britain, um, sort of the Far East. Although Egypt did have a special uh, status as a, as yes. a prefecture. Yes, yes. yes. But, 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 but you know what I mean? But, 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 but Egypt aside, provinces. you're talking about all the external provinces, Mesia, Ratio, um, yes. uh, Germania Superior, et cetera, et cetera. Like the, yeah. Um, well, well in, in my, to my mind, um, with the American Empire, the United States itself is the senatorial provinces provinces of, of the GAE or the or the GAE, while the um, all of the vassal countries, so like or NATO, maybe we could say, are like the Roman imperial provinces, being like the the buffer or the frontier. What, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, so, sorry, uh, ma'am, can you repeat that? Sorry, I just I didn't catch what you said. Uh, the, what I was saying is, like, with the Roman Empire, you've got the senatorial provinces and the mm -hmm. imperial provinces. Oh, no, I, I heard that much, yeah. Yeah. So with with the GAE or the, the GAE, uh, the yeah. domestic United States, you know, the 50 states of the Union, mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. the senatorial province, provinces, yeah. While, yeah, yeah. While, while, say, NATO is the, um, you know, the imperial The provinces. vassal states, yeah. Yes. 
the imperial provinces, the frontier. Mm. I mean, I, I would say I wouldn't say it's the same. I'd say there are similarities um, yes. because I mean, ultimately, the the senatorial provinces and the and the administrative provinces were sort of they both answered to Rome equally. They were both a part of the same political, cultural, administrative, militaristic entity, which is not true of the GAE. But I, I definitely see it insofar as, um, you know, uh, perhaps if you look at, say... Um, well, 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 I guess... Well, the, well, the, let, let me just, okay, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, well, something I... The way I'm coming at it is that, obviously, with the uh, United States, you've got the Senate, and you've got all the different states and all their different governorships. There's, a, in some way, the actual senatorial provinces of the United States, the interior areas are more self-governing and autonomous from power than say the exterior um, NATO countries are and I feel like that was the same with the empire because the senatorial provinces were under governorship of the senate mm. the senate had a bit of autonomy from from the emperor whereas with the imperial provinces less so because the emperor was directly governing them mm -hmm. yeah no but I, I think from maybe from that standpoint it makes makes sense and I, I would agree at least, at least to an extent it's it's a, it's a worthwhile observation at least um yeah i just think that there's i think what what makes it difficult for the gae or uh, you know or whatever anyone wants to call it is um is that you know you are in this sort of post enlightenment notion of say nationalism and even though nationalism is a dirty word nowadays and expressions of of nationalism that don't suit the powers that be is ordinarily uh you know, downtrodden and discouraged and and actively corroded as a force, um, you still have these individual sort of socio-cultural expressions of people, you know, like, you know, within NATO, you still have Spaniards and Germans and Austrians and Italians and, you know, Danes and Poles and whoever else, you know, everyone, you know, Greeks, Turks, I suppose, technically part of NATO as well. Um, you know that 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 don't share this sort of cultural, um, sort of collective identity with America. You know, they're they're, they're all very different people, with different mores and different norms, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. All these all these things that make them distinct, right? Languages, etc. Whereas I think with Rome, it's a little bit different. But I understand, like from a mechanical perspective, like a like a methodological perspective, what you're getting at, and I think that makes sense. But I think, um, I think also true that is actually the weakness of the American issue as well. Like as much as America, as much as Roman's problem sort of eventually led to its own atrophy, maybe this is why we're seeing this atrophy being accelerated with America, is because you have that sort of cultural and and social and political difference that you know these places aren't the same. Therefore, people have more exaggerate differences and that makes the system more untenable it's a thought i don't know the answer but it's a thought no certainly and um, i just want to address not sure in the chat um was infiltration the major factor in the fall i'm ignorant on history to tbh um well there was infiltration to an extent because the romans did allow um hordes of barbarians to to migrate in and then once i realized that that was a mistake due to um friction um it all kind of went downhill from there but We've already made, um, I think, enough of a um, tangent from Caesar, so let's um, return to the main subject at hand. So, indeed, um, yeah, back so, to the man himself. Yes, yes. So, with the um, the civil war, um, so Caesar, what he does, he crosses the Rubicon, which is important because in Roman Italy itself, uh, Italy as a political unit was only uh, south of the River Rubicon um, of Italy proper. Um, it didn't include, as we've said before, Sicily and Gaul, which was. Um, northern italy and i don't think it either included the um, outer islands like sicily or um or sardinia at this point either so you know because um sicily and gaul was caesar's province he was allowed to have station military troops there but by crossing over into um, italy proper that was why it was such a transgression and it initiated the, um, the civil war so he marches in. Uh, we, we should we should actually say too, like just for the sake of context. Sorry to interrupt you, man, but we should actually make the point too that the Senate demand that Caesar surrenders his legions, and Cato successfully rallies the Senate that Caesar be brought to trial, both for alleged crimes committed in Gaul, for the fact that the campaign in Gaul was, Cato would argue, and his supporters argued, an illegal war. In the end. 
the Helvet the the incursion of the Helvetii and Brabracte mm, justifiable, but then obviously Caesar marches into Gaul and partakes in this um, campaign of conquest, which is the main sticking point for Cato and his supporters. And also the third point too was this illegal activity. I, I actually had mentioned Bibulus, his co-consul before. There's um I can't remember if it was Plutarch or Suetonius, but basically someone says that you know Bibulus was regularly harassed by sort of the Caesarian um to use an Italian word ultras, but you know, like um basically thugs, right? Street thugs, gangs or whatever they were sort of pro Caesar. You know, they would they would, you know, bash Bibulus in the street and they would heckle him and they would, you know, deride him, they'd insult his relatives. And often he was actually seen pelted with dung. Um, you know, with both the human and the and the animal variety. And basically Bibulus was it was made almost impossible for him to ever attend the Senate hearing. So Caesar basically functioned as a, as a lone consul in many ways. Whether how much of that is an embellishment, I don't know. But again, this would play into Caesar's sort of political ambition, and he was never a person who didn't resort to tactics, you might say. So these are the three reasons that the the optimates in Rome in in, in the Senate basically put this fate accompli to Caesar. And essentially, Caesar's left with a choice. Do I surrender myself to the Senate, therefore basically subjecting myself to potential exile or death? You know, at the, at the, the, his enemies are so um, unified now, not saying numerous, but unified, particularly amongst the aristocracy in the Senate, that Caesar would probably be success successfully prosecuted. And, you know, like I said, he could be stripped of his wealth, he could be killed, he could be exiled. Caesar could be ruined in all manner of ways. Or he could refuse the ultimatum, march on Rome, initiate the civil war. Caesar chooses to cross the Rubicon. And in doing so, he is said to have ushered the words, Alia Iacta Est. Funnily enough, people say, oh, the die is cast. But the die is cast has two meanings. There is, as in the product die being cast into fabric, implying that the die is therefore cast, it's done, it's finished, you know, it, 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 it's irretrievable, there's no going back, you can't undo it. It's it's it, you know, Once that river is crossed, we, I, me, my soldiers are all enemies of the Roman state. And, you, and there's no U-turn from that. The other meaning is a gambler's term, is that the die, as in numerical die, are cast into the air, and no one knows which way they're going to land, you know, it, it is all down to chance now. It's in the sort of so-called lap of the gods. It's interesting that Caesar picks that term, Ali Yacht Est, dies cast. It's a, it's a phrase with two meanings. Um, yes, um, perhaps at that moment he was um, really hoping that his years of veneration for Venus were going to um, to bear fruit for him. Yes, may, 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 fav may, favor, uh, may fortune favour the darling of Venus. Yes. Um, yeah, so he marches uh, to Rome itself. Um, all the senators and Pompey flee. Um, so what they decide to do is, because Pompey's got um, Libya and Iberia loyal to him, because if you imagine the geography, so Caesar's got Gaul and he's got um, northern and central Italy, um, but the rest of the Roman provinces on the exterior around Italy are under the Senate's control. So their plan is is to basically avoid fighting him um, rally an army in the provinces and then use his sort of superior resources to um, wear him down over time. Mm. And, um... and also, I made the point too about the line from the show where Pompey says, you know, all I have to do is stamp my foot and legions will pop up over Italy. One, they probably didn't think that Caesar would have the stones to actually do it, which he obviously does cross the river, but he also does a smart thing. He only has one legion stationed in Ravenna, which is, you know, which was his headquarters in Cisalpine Gaul. The nature and the advantage of marching with a single legion at this point, let's not forget that the 13th, like the 10th, like the 12th, like the 7th, like all these veteran legions are not a full strength. In fact, they're actually quite dilapidated. It's probably more like half a legion, really, if we're thinking about it. A small army can march quickly. And like I said, mentioned with the start of the screen when i talked about like the phenomenal endurance of the roman soldier and their, their relentless training and their strength and their stamina and the drill the relentless drilling it was nothing for a roman force to march 30 miles a day a half legion could probably march 20 30 percent further 
and do so at a greater intensity, you know, because they didn't have so much baggage. You know, a small amount of men are just inherently more maneuverable. And so Caesar basically charges down from Ravenna and, you know, he, he marches through what sort of modern day um, Umbria and Tuscany at this rate of speed. And he, 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 um, he, uh, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for? He basically catches the Senate off guard. You know, he, he wrong foots them, you know, he, he's moving and it's, and it's typical of Caesar's campaigns. Like he actually fights in this sort of, he's Napoleon before Napoleon. He, he, he exemplifies this, you know, this fast high tempo warfare. And before they know it, Caesar's bearing down on Rome and the Senate doesn't have an army. In fact, the Senate has, I think, like one and a half legion stationed in the city, but half that half legion, a, a pro Caesarian that basically Caesar's men who have been returned to the Senate, you know, prior to things going awry, and the other full legion are just raw recruits. So this the Senate makes this call to tactically withdraw out of Rome, but then they withdraw to Corfinium, and then they withdraw to, I can't remember, the other city, um, somewhere in, 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 the, the, in the center of the southern boot, and then eventually to Bari, where they, um, Bari or Brundisium, I can't remember, and then they eventually evacuate to Greece. And it's all because Caesar has just moved with such astonishing rapidity, such huge speed. <clears throat> yes, it's sort of the, uh, the, the shock of, of advance um, and having the, the initiative. Um, so... Yeah, so he basically consolidates Italy, uh, or mainland Italy, quite quickly. Um, he, in Rome itself, he's declared a dictator for a short period of time, and he sort of stabilises the situation. He then voluntarily gives up his um, dictatorship, and um, he starts to get ready um, to march over into Greece. But before he does that, um, he does a excellent um, military manoeuvre, where he sends legions to um, take out Spain, because as we said before, Spain... Is... Well, he actually leads the army to Spain himself. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, so he leads the army, to, he goes to Spain, because as we've established, um, so Italy and Gaul are surrounded by all the other Roman provinces, which are loyal to Pompey and the Senate, and Spain especially is very loyal to Pompey. So Caesar goes and basically tries to, basically conquers Spain from Pompey, right away to deprive him of this little base of troops and resources, uh, which I think is very instrumental in his success mm. long term. And on that basis, I mean, we won't get into it, but there's a very fascinating sort of this sort of battle of wits and manoeuvre at Alerta. It's probably, if you really wanted to understand how ancient warfare can be conducted between two standing armies in this sort of period of the Iron Age, a loader is, is is a wonderful example of that where you know patience and diligence and engineering and sort of small scale maneuver and the taking of hilltops and small scale fortifications and Caesar eventually triumphs. And I'm trying to think of the Roman commanders uh, on Pompey's side uh, that are there because one of them actually eventually sort of escapes and then sort of rejoins the Pompeians and ends up fighting with them all through Greece and Africa and and wherever. Um, I've just I've just gone blank, but uh he so there's a roman force under a subordinate that's besieging massilia at this point because uh, uh, massilia is pro pompey um even though it's in mm -hmm. gaul technically um and then caesar um marches into spain with the remainder of his legions he 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 does eventually vanquish the pompeian force at alerta and after they're defeated um alerta he uh, the, the remaining parts of um of Spain more or less capitulates. I think there's only like one or two legions in the south and one defects and one surrenders and eventually the Pompeian commanders flee Spain. And at this point, because Pompey has allies in the east, like we mentioned earlier in the stream, Pompey has conquered, you know, Seleucid Syria. He's conquered Calicia. He's he's um he's helped pacify you know the remnants of the you know, the Mithridatic or the successor kingdoms of Mithridates in, in Asia Minor. And the client kingdoms that are there, sort of in Bithynia, in Paphlagonia, in Cappadocia, are loyal to Pompey. Plus, he has a friendship with Ptolemy, who, you know, um, you know, prior to this point was obviously Pharaoh in Egypt, his son, and his daughters are in amidst a power struggle in Egypt at this point. But Egypt is pro-Pompey as well. So it, Pompey's in Greece just coalescing this force, you know, all this strength, you know, he's gaining money, he's gaining taxes, he's gaining contributions, allies are giving him troops and, and, and money. And so Caesar uses this time to sort of quash Spain and incorporate to his circles because of his also, because Caesar was a praetor in Spain. Caesar has his own loyalists in Spain too. 
So it makes sense for him to actually target Spain first. Mm, yes, and also it's um because also because it's right close to Gaul, um, which is sort of Caesar's most um, turf, so to speak. Um, he's um, it's vulnerable, so dealing with Spain makes sense. Mm, and um, yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, I remember, I remember the commander now, Lucius Afranius. Okay. Yeah, and Petraeus was the second command. I just checked it on Wikipedia. Yeah, right. but Afranius is famous because Afranius is like one of the last ones who end up fighting at Munda at the very end as well. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I also recall. Um, I think it's the campaign in Spain where Caesar um, decides to make um, Octavian his heir, um, if I recall, and because I think um, Octavian goes on campaign with him. That's th that's the second Spanish campaign. That's Munda. Ah, it's at the right. end of the Civil War. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I, knew, I knew it was in Spain. So, uh, but anyway, so after Spain's dealt with, Caesar then masses an army and he crosses over um, the Adriatic into Greece. And um, initially, there's a setback. Um, I think it's um, at Dyrrhachium, where there's a battle. Uh, it's inconclusive, and Caesar is forced to withdraw. However, uh, later... worse than inconclusive, it's probably um, if you were to say that Jojovia in Gaul which was prior to Elysia, and Caesar got his nose bloodied. Caesar was very lucky not to actually lose his army at Dyrrhachium. Mm -hmm. Even though Caesar managed with earthworks to sort of hem in Pompey at Dyrrhachium, which is Monday Durez in Albania, mm -hmm. Pompey actually kind of gets the better of Caesar and outsmarts him and manages to break apart the fortifications. And then there's this terrible scramble, the sort of south end of these fortifications where sort of men get stuck in ditches and palisades fall away and, you know, Pompey loses a few troops and Caesar loses a few troops. But because Pompey has built this power base in Greece and has a lot of Greek allies and, you know, has this you know, power, because I think it's um, Amphipoli, he's, or Amphipolis as the Greeks would call it, um, is like his centre and he has all these sort of regional allies. You know, he's sort of essentially fighting on home turf and, and Caesar is the one who's extending his supply lines, you know, he has to um he has to forage and you know he's lost ships crossing the the adriatic because again see uh pompey's son sextus who pops up again and again and again from this point commands a strong navy and so caesar's constantly being harassed and his his supply lines are harried and he's sort of in this constant problem of, of, of you know supply and naval inferiority um and then um it's the one time Caesar loses control of his army. He actually tries. He actually, um, at Dyrrhachium, he, in fact, had to have a standard, beer, a standard bearer arrested because the standard bearer tried to stab him because Caesar was trying to take his eagle so that he would, you know, march forward with it. If you can imagine that scene out of the Patriot where, you know, Mel Gibson gets the American flag and they all turn around. Caesar was trying to do that Dyrrhachium, but the troops don't respond. They flee. It's actually the one time his army enters into a mass panic. And... Had Pompey not fought as a, it was a ruse, it could have been the end of Caesar. But Pompey actually thinks it's a ruse. And so Pompey's troops stay within the, their own walls. And Caesar lives to fight another day. But he disengages from Dyrrhachium. And he meets up with a blocking force that was deployed near Thessalonica. I can't remember under whose command, one of his subordinates. And they reunite those two armies. And then there's like a third force that Caesar has facing Thessaly, which is to the south of where they are. And then there's this constant cat and mouse through Greece um, between... Should I just go on to Pharsalus Hitman since we're, since we're here? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. So so they're playing cat and mouse, cat and mouse. But then there's this increasing pressure from the Senate. It's like, no, you actually have to engage Caesar. Like, you know, this is... Caesar's an enemy and we have to destroy him. The honourable thing is to, you know, kill him. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, to defeat his army and to kill him at this point mainly Cato is in this camp. Um, and eventually Pompey picks what would be the best place for him to fight. He's got a river covering one flank, which d denies or inhibits Caesar's great, one of his greatest qualities, which is maneuver. And so Pharsalus is this place in Greece. It's a relatively low flatland, although Pompey placed himself on the high ground. Um, Caesar's at a disadvantage. February, for every two troops of Caesars, they face about three of Pompey's. It could even be as many as two to one, the difference, but who's to really know the numbers? But where Pompey actually has a lot of advantages in cavalry, because for those who know, Anatolia, places like um, Cappadocia were and even sort of Syria were renowned for their cavalry. 
and of course it's in, in in the in the immediate aftermath of this sort of like hellenistic diadochi period where sort of the greeks started to utilize particularly the seleucids were using the cataphracts and you know, the sort of heavily armored cavalry that we see develop in the east you know he's being used at this time and plus you know there's all these other allies you know there's greek allies in it they would fight in sort of like a similar style to alexander's companions you know the sort of greek cavalry he, he has all these contingents that form a strong cavalry force and caesar has a a meager handful of roman and even ex-gallic cavalry um and caesar probably outnumbered 10 to 1 or 8 to 1 in cavalry in the cavalry context which being outnumbered in infantry is bad enough but being outnumbered to such a degree even more in the more exaggerated sense with cavalry is even worse but Caesar, this is where Pharsalus is probably one of the great set piece battles, more because of the difference in terms of, you know, Pompey's well supplied, Caesar's men are on the verge of starvation. Um, you know, Pompey has a numerical advantage in infantry and, and especially, and more so in cavalry. He's picked the ground, he's in a defensive formation. He, you know, he's all the things are in Pompey's favor, which in some ways is his undoing because he's not forced to think, you know, outside the box which is Caesar's specialty. Caesar aligns his men into, into three lines, but then what he does, he actually peels a cohort off each line, off each lead, or not each lead, each legion, but he pulls a, a, a sort of a cohort from each, the left, the center, the right, off each of his three lines, creates like a pseudo fourth line, which he deploys behind a, 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 a you know collection of little hills that he has his cavalry deployed on. And a fastless, you know, Caesar orders his infantry forward because Pompey would not attack Caesar. Um, and there's this remarkable point at um Pharsalus where sort of his men charge across the field or you know jog across the field, take a break, get their breath back, and then they jog within peeler range and catching the Pompeians off guard, actually throw their peeler first. The quite devastating effect. And then the first Roman line engages the Pompeians. Meanwhile, Pompey does the expedient thing attacks with his cavalry engages caesar's cavalry caesar's cavalry stands for a few minutes and then just flees but they flee in the direction of this fourth line hidden behind a hill and caesar has instructed the the soldiers to not discharge their peeler but to use them like spears and if their spears break then to use their swords to cut at the legs of the horses and so so pompey has no idea that this fourth line exists and so caesar's cavalry then sort of rallies and between Caesar's fourth line and his cavalry encircle the Pompeian cavalry, a huge number of them are killed and the rest flee. So Caesar's, what's left of his cavalry and his fourth line, wrap around Pompey's infantry block, which is what it is, and just rolls it up like a carpet. Um, many of Pompey's veteran legions actually withdraw from the line successfully. Um, actually, I think Dando Collins touches on this, if I can reference it but but um but Pharsalus is an act of 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 tactical masterpiece where caesar's at a at a tremendous disadvantage and um and so um where where pompey had almost all of the uh, you know the, if you were to if you were to be a person and say, listen, this is this force and this is this force, this is this location, that location, nine out of ten rational people would pick Pompey's position because it had almost all the advantages. But again, who's the differing factor in this equation? It is Julius Caesar, his character, his disposition, his um, you know, and he, and his quality as a tactician, as a motivator of men, and as a way of this sort of. Caesar always confronted with a problem. You know, he's the first man to bridge the Rhine. He's the first man to to cross into to Britain. You know, he was the first man to defeat the Gallic Veneti, not to be confused with the northern Italian Veneti at sea, who are basically a seafaring Gallic people who live in modern day um, Brittany. Um, he always, always found a route to victory. And Pharsalus is arguably one of the the great um, the great exponents of that. Um, Pharsalus also is is important because it's where he mentions a fourth person. So I've mentioned Baculus at the Sabus, and we've touched on Titus Pullo and Lucius Verinus from the show HBO's Rome. This is where another person comes to light, a centurion by the name of Gaius Crustinus, uh, who was um, he was the chief centurion of the 10th legion, but then after the Gallic war was discharged, but then actually returned to service 
once the Civil War kicked off and was placed at the command of the first cohort of the 10th Legion. So you could imagine he was a man of considerable, you know, fame within the Legion and of great fighting quality. Um, and Caesar actually said to have wept when he came across his um, body because Crassinus actually led that initial attack, that first line, that first peeler throw. But Crassinus was actually slain in the battle. I'm actually trying to find the line because I know it's in this book somewhere. So the, the, first, the first cohort first into battle. Yeah, and, and of the 10th, which is the elite of the elite. Like the, the 10th were always the, the ones who are in the place of honour and always fought first. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, um, it's actually said that Caesar, when he came across Crassinus' body in the aftermath of the battle, actually wept because he, he considered... Crassinus to have been amongst the finest of his soldiers. Um, I'm hoping I could actually find this ex excerpt, but um, um, you know, it, it's just remarkable because we sort of think, you know, like Caesar the reveler, Caesar the you know the exuberant spender buying a short career, Caesar the the womanizer, Caesar the general, Caesar the consul, Caesar the dictator. There's all these sort of big natured things by which we, you know, consider Caesar. But we don't think of Caesar, the man who weeps over the death of an ordinary centurion, you know, whose name, had he not been written in Caesar's commentaries, would have been forgotten to history, like Baculus. You know, these, these men would have fallen into eternal anonymity. But because of Caesar's writing, we now know of, of people like um, of Crassinus. Um, well, I mean, these are, these are matters of, of, you know, life, death, you know, war, you know, you're talking about these are banquets, you know, that's just a bit, a bit of a fun, vapid party. It's not of any serious consequence while, you know, fighting and, and dying for, you know, someone who you've dedicated your, your life and service to, you know, it's, it, it's important. Hmm. Yeah, no, I'm just sorry. I, I, I keep coming across his name. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh... Oh, okay. So it's, I've actually found it here. Um, on the run, the front line let fly with their javelins. At the same time, in Pompey's front line, the centurions called order to loose their peeler, but did so too late. The men of Pompey's front line were met by Caesar's uh, advance of the, uh, sorry, by Caesar's charge of their first line with javelins hanging from many shields and being. Um, sorry with javelins hanging from many a shield the remaining men locked them together in a desperate struggle with an almighty crash caesar's front line washed onto the pompeian shield wall despite the impact of the charge pompey's line initially held firm now standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with their adversary caesar's men tried to hack away through the shield line on caesar's right wing centurion crassinus uh Repulse in his initial charge was moving from cohort to cohort as his men tried to break through the immovable first legion line amongst Pompey's best troops, urging on his legionnaires at the top of his voice above the din of battle. Crassinus threw himself into, at the shield line at the front, aiming to show his men how to reach over the top of an enemy shield and strike at the face of the soldier on the other side with the point of his sword. As he did, he felt a blow to the side of his head. He never even saw it coming. The strength suddenly drained from his legs. He sagged, sagged to his knees, his head spinning dazed. He continued to call out to his men and spur them on. As he spoke, a legionnaire, a legionary from Pompey's first legion, directly opposite him in the shield line, moved his shield six inches to the left, opening a small gap. In a flash, he shoved the sword through the gap with a powerful forward thrust that entered into the yelling Crassinus's open mouth. According to Plutarch, the tip of the blade emerged from the back of Crassinus's head. The soldier of the first withdrew his bloodied sword and swiftly resealed the gap of the shield line. His action had lasted just seconds, no doubt with a crude cheer from nearby men of the First Legion. Centurion Crassinus toppled forward into the shield in front of him, then slid into the ground to his death. I mean, I know that's a little bit on the graphic side, but such was fighting in the legion and particularly legion against legion especially amongst experienced men it was gruesome and it was bloody 
Um, and for, I suppose, Plutarch probably writing from Caesar's accounts, um, why is Gaius Crassinus there? You know, it's a touching, it's a touching, you know, part of this, the story in a, in a sense, you know? Mm, yeah, see, so there's, in a way, there's more to the story of Caesar than just Caesar himself. Exactly. And and this is the thing, like, you know, we, we, we hear Bacillus at the Sarbus, Crassinus at Pharsalus, you know, Pullon of Renus, um, although that's much embellished by the show. But we get an insight into the into the, the little people that followed Caesar in, in this case and, and where he's, he's, you know, I know we joke about our oh, finer soldiers, you know, online, it's a bit of a joke, but they were Caesar's finer soldiers. They were his, his best centurions and his best leaders and history thankfully hasn't forgotten them. And Caesar was the kind of man who actually inspires this almost fanatical loyalty. Um, you know, this, this sort of do or die adult attitude where his men, no matter how hard pressed, no matter how, in, in in how much danger they were, how fraught they were, with the exception of Dyrachium. Um, they just don't break, they don't yield, they never give up, and they almost always find a way to win. And I just I just even like this impressed me as a 15 year old. And now that I'm in my 30s, it still impresses me. You know, I don't I don't think it'll ever change. Oh no, no, it's um it's fascinating stuff, the the, the lengths that um a man will go to fight for what he believes in. Exactly right. Exactly right. And, and this is also an important part of, you know, maybe understand that point of Caesarism, whereby this, I, I kind of loathe to call it a cult of personality, but this cult of personality that just sort of creates such huge motivation in people is a dedicated sort of unyielding, you know, indomitable loyalty in this, this sort of furnace of, 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 of courage that sort of em can emblazon the spirit of a man to action, um, which again is probably one of those things about Caesarism conceptually that perhaps is overlooked. Um, you know, particular kind of men will follow someone like a Caesar, a Julius Caesar. You know what I mean? It, it, you can't get that kind of inspiration just by being, you know, a Fabius Maximus or a Pompey Magnus or you know, no necessarily lesser men, but just men that don't have those qualities that inspire that following to the same degree that Caesar did. Mm. Yes, and um, I'm also sort of thinking that, you know, thanks to Caesar, you've been given a purpose in life which you can achieve and uh, find self-actualization. Because um, I remember uh, AA's talked about this, but um, in Revolt Against the Modern World, you've got that chapter by Evola where he's talking about a man and woman and it says for a man to find a self actualization, you've either got the um the path of the warrior or the um path of contemplate path of action and the path of contemplation. With the path of action, you know, being like a being like a warrior, you know, if, if a man isn't a warrior or or you know some sort of contemplative like scholar or, or monk, he he can't find you know happiness or sustenance or satisfaction with life. Precisely, uh, you know, it takes it takes particular. Um, it takes particular leaders to to extract, you might say, the human and spiritual potential in those that follow them. And this is one of the things that is desperately misunderstood about leadership as a concept. You know, like for all these talking heads who go to, you know, um, you know, what would you call them, like exhibition halls or, you know, conference centres and talk about leadership and like in this sort of bland commercial sense like this is leadership you know studying people like caesar or rommel or napoleon or um you know richard leinhardt or, or alexander or pyrrhus or or um you know, demetrius you know Monotha uh, the son of antigonos um you know if you want to go further back in history you know ramses i suppose ramses the second to some extent um you know, Leonidas and his stand at Thermopylae. Um, um, I suppose these people who follow them have their innate character and their innate spiritual motiva motivation, but being led by, you might say, the lion, you know, you know, you, you mentioned about AA and his, in his analogies, like, he, we all, uh, uh, I can't remember who this comes from, whether it's um, Spengler or whether it's um, 
uh, or whether it's Evola, Fox and Wolves, I can't remember who created that analogy. But again, it's, you know, like the, the wolf and the fox have different motivations themselves, even though they're sort of both predators, you know. They have different methodologies of engaging with that. And part of Caesar's fox, part of Caesar's wolf. Um, but, you know, just men will do certain things under the leadership of certain people that they wouldn't have do under someone else. Like, would Crassinus have fought the same way under Pompey? Maybe, maybe not. Would Baculus have held the line at Sarbus if he fought under Marcus Crassus? I would perhaps doubt it. I don't know. I'm sort of engaging in a, you know, um, what do you call it? I'm engaging hypotheticals and counterfactuals. But we, we have to do these mental exercises amongst ourselves to be able to sort of, you know, arrive at conclusions. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. No, absolutely. And um, I just want to address the, the chat quickly. Um, I'm not actually a Zoomer. I am a little, I'm a little bit too old to be a Zoomer, um, if any of the people are interested. So I'm, I'm young, but I'm not that young. But um, yeah, so... Um, well, I'm certainly not. I'm a relic of comparison, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, anywho, so yes, we've got Pharsalus. Um, Caesar wins this uh, crushing victory um, over over Pompey. Uh, Pompey flees to um, Egypt, um, and then Caesar pursues him with quite a small force, I should say. Um, and when he arrives there... Um, so Pompey, he's murdered by the court of um, King Ptolemy. As I should say, the father's died, and now it's the dispute, as you mentioned, between the son and the daughter, where it's Cleopatra and Pomp Ptolemy. And, and the other, and the other, and the and the other sister, Arizono, uh, 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 I think her name is. Oh, I can't remember, oh, but yeah, Arsino. there's this two. Arsino Arsino, Arsino, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, there's two sisters and Pompey. I think thirteen. I think you're right. I'll double check it. But I think you're right. Um, yeah, and. Um, because they actually were married uh, to each other. Sorry, not the... Ptolemy, uh, not Pompey. I meant Ptolemy. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Because um, as the as the Ptolemaic tradition, um, both Cleopatra and um, Ptolemy were both married to each other and were supposed to co co rule, but um, that rapidly broke down and um, there was a, a civil war. Caesar comes along pursuing Pompey. Pompey's murdered by um, by by Ptolemy. And um, having to mention HBO's Rome again, but that scene where um, he's presented Pompey's head on the platter and he looks utterly revolted. And he just screams, he was a consul of Rome! Oh, he was a like consul perfect. of Rome! Such barbarity on the house of Ptolemy. Shame for such barbarity. It's a great scene, by the way. It, yeah, it, it is great. And, and, and I love how they like trend, they, they initially start like braggadocious, like, oh, Caesar will be impressed by, you know, because, oh, Pompey was his enemy, blah, blah, blah. And like immediately after the outburst, they sort of like their ball shrink and they sort of like always groveling. It's like, no, no, no. He was buried with all respect and decorum. <laughs> they sort of <laughs> shrink back into their shell. <laughs> oh, the pathetic fem effeminate eunuchs for you. So, <laughs> but, but this is also true. And I'm, I don't know where I sit on the whole. You get someone like, um, Professor Peter Colony, uh, uh, uh sorry, uh, Peter, um, uh, Connolly, who who was a famed Roman historian, a lot of like the um the illustrations you see of like Roman soldiers that are done in books, like the Esprit books, were actually done by by Peter. Like you know, he's he's a very renowned professor. He passed away about twenty years ago now, I would say twenty something years ago. Um, but he was of the mind that sort of Caesar kind of knew it was the job that had to be done and was probably, you know not that emotionally invested in it. I actually take a bit of a different position. When you actually look at Caesar's capacity for clemency and the fact that he did wish to genuinely make amends with people like Cicero, you know, he welcomed back Brutus, who he did see as an adoptive son. Some consider him to have been side by Caesar. I think there's merit to that argument, but probably a discussion for another day because that's a whole other tangent. Um, you know, he, he he he's very open about this. And and even, you know, when Cato does kill himself in North Africa after Thapsus, um, you know, Caesar's laments the fact that Cato didn't even, you know, Cato being Cato would never have wanted to have been offered clemency because he just wasn't that way wired up. But Caesar kind of admired for all these cantankerousness and 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 hostility, he admired sort of like this purity that existed in Cato. And I don't know if Caesar necessarily would have wanted the death of Pompey. I, I'm not sold on that theory. But either which way, um, I do agree with Peter that the death of Pompey uncomplicates 
the future for Ciso in many ways. He doesn't have to deal with Pompey's a problem. That's not to say that he was it's glad by it. I th- I th- it was convenient politically and from a standpoint of expediency, but I still think that if Caesar was actually able to have the choice, he probably would have chosen for Pompey to live. But that's just me. Mm, certainly. Um, yeah, so so Caesar, with his very small force, um, intervenes in this um, sort of civil war in Egypt and he sides with um, Cleopatra, um, defeats Ptolemy the Thirteenth making Cleopatra the sole ruler of Egypt. Uh, he has an effect fling with her. Caesarian pops out nine months later, so he's now got this um, a second heir, so to speak, um, essentially. And, well, um, and more importantly, a blood male descendant. Yes, absolutely. Um, while this is going on, um, Pharnaces, who is the son of the Mithridates we mentioned earlier, who's the king of the Bosporan kingdom, decides to... Um, take advantage of chaos and invade several Roman client states in the east. And um, Caesar, immediately after dealing with Egypt, then marches over and deals with him. Mm. And it's after this campaign that Caesar coins his famous um, Wenny, Witty, Wiki, I came, I saw, I conquered. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sort of Farnaki's attempts to reconquer Anatolia and does the unintelligent thing of incurring Caesar's, you know, dismay. (laughs) Yes. Um, um, and, and, and interestingly enough, the Battle of Zella is actually fought with a large number of Pompeian veterans as well, strangely enough. One of those interesting quirks of history. Um, well, I think... Sorry, go on, Hitman. Um, yes, well, I'm just thinking, well, they followed Pompey because he was this military hero and now the hero's been defeated. Caesar's like the new hero, so they're going to follow mm. him, aren't they? Correct. And what's interesting, too, is that Caesar um, actually has a subordinate while Caesar is extricating himself out of Egypt, because it's actually it's not so straightforward. Actually, Caesar's contest in that Nile campaign and being besieged in Alexandria is actually quite a fraught. Uh, uh, I only actually found out myself a couple of years ago just how fraught and how difficult that little sideshow was. You know, I didn't realize I didn't realize as much of a military aspect to it, but there, in fact, is very interesting, very interesting thing to delve into if you're so inclined. Um, um, but um, well, sorry, go okay, on, um, oh, okay. Um, uh, I'll just go, uh, sorry, you go, you go, and then I'll talk. Okay. <laughs> what are you gonna say? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, well, this might be a good time to, um, as I mentioned to you before we went live, um, about, um, for those watching, um, me and Marcus did two other streams discussing the work of a uh, general JFC Fuller and his book, The Conduct of War. Um, Fuller has another book on Caesar, which is called um, Julius Caesar, a Man, Soldier and Tyrant. And uh, now I think it's a good opportunity to bring that book up because um, Fuller's got some very interesting criticisms of Caesar and a lot of it relates to his military campaigns. And so I'll just sort of come out with it. Uh, Fuller's main critique of Caesar is that when Caesar's on campaign, he has a tendency to, in his mind, in Fuller's mind, to not really be able to focus on what is the main important objective and get sidetracked. So, for example, if we're going back to the Gaulic campaign, that little um, expedition to Britain, it didn't really achieve anything, and it got some of his men killed, and it weakened the position in Gaul, and he then ha- then had to come back later and, and mop up. And then later, when you've got um, the campaign after the defeat of Pompey at Pharsalus, to Fuller's mind, um, he compares Pompey after Pharsalus, like Hannibal after Zama, You've got this great, um, power, powerful um, military mind who's been defeated and disgraced. Um, they've lost all they've lost all respect from people, so they're, they're no real threat. So, so Fuller's mind, it was a waste of time going after Pompey, because what you have to remember is at this time, Pompey's son and Metellus Scipio were still holding on to um, what's now Africa and modern Tunisia, as well as Sicily and some other Greek islands, and you know, with a sizable fleet. Um, causing a lot of havoc back home. So by then pursuing Pompey and then spending like a year dealing with Egypt and then dealing with um, Pharnaces, um, in his mind, what Caesar should have done was gone straight back to Italy um, finished off the Pompeians and then before dealing with, with other issues. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I actually, I don't necessarily agree with Fuller criticising Caesar in terms of um like you might say the characteristic criticism but i do agree that caesar um after pharsalus if i may use a a britishism caesar faffs around rather (laughs) too much in the in the near east you know between egypt and and zeller and 
Anatolia and you know, like he had he just driven the sword into the Pompeians and not let them coalesce because you got to think two things happened they coalesce in North Africa in the Thapsus you know either side of the Thapsus battle which is itself is actually a close run affair again Caesar nearly is um is slain by uh, Lab- Labienus uh, uh, at a skirmish just outside of um I'm trying to think of the it's it's leading up to Thapsus it might be somewhere near um you know like the modern day sort of um uh, uh to uh, libyan tunisian border i just can't think of the place at the moment but there's sort of like this skirmish that happens and it just so happens that one of caesar's veterans th- hurls his, his peeler at labianus's horse and unhorses him and actually injures labianus and had he had that not happened caesar might have actually found himself dead on a battlefield uh again one of those sort of lucky you know streaks of provenance that sort of happens to occur in Caesar's career where he had his one legion who was gifted enough just to throw that peel accurately and and kill Labienus's horse and he, he was injured by being unhorsed um so they coalesce in in Thapsus uh, under Scipio Met- uh, Metellius Scipio and uh and Cato the younger obviously and then after defeating the Methapsus enough of them escape that they then able to escape with a core of veterans again and then recoalesce back in Spain, which is the province that Caesar first pacified at the start, like after he conquered Italy. Um, yeah, no, and and just he sort of lets them out of the, the loop. But that's the thing, what's so critical about Munda is that Caesar then learns a lesson at Munda, does not let them get away. Like he sends detachments to besiege every single settlement that is in the vicinity of Munda. And he basically captures and kills, or, you know, not kills in every sense, but like, you know, he he destroys every vestige of the pro-Pompeian forces and makes sure that all but Sextus Pompey, who actually escapes, because another because his other brother, uh, I think is um I'm trying to think of the young the other brother's name, but he's captured and actually commits suicide on 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 the beach of the coastline somewhere, trying to outrun the Caesareans. And only Sextus escapes with his entourage and like a few troops. And as we know, Sextus then goes on to sort of be the 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 prime pirate of the Mediterranean based in Sicily and having his little private Navy. And he becomes a thorn in the side for Alex, uh, for, for Octavian and Mark Antony later. But Caesar certainly after Munda learns his mistake of Pharsalus and, and, and Thapsus and, you know, eviscerates his enemy in the aftermath of battle does not give them a chance to recoalesce a fourth time as it would be. Um, mm-hmm. the, the small point I just want to make about Zella, cause we just, I, I was, we were just talking about Zella before. Zella's actually that, that campaign is initially commanded by a subordinate whose name I actually can't rem- remember at the moment, and it's his troops that he's levied across Anatolia who actually flee in the face of Pharnaces' army. But it's the Pompeian veterans of all the troops in that army that actually don't flee, and they they're actually the ones who dig defensive earthworks and sort of form this sort of you know this orb and they sort of hold their position much to this pleasure of Pharnaces. But it's the rest of these levied recruits that flee the battle. Um, and then Caesar's left the sort of he dashes to Anatolia and retrieves the situation from his subordinate who just mishandled the campaign. Um, and again, it's that you know ill-experienced commander with ill-experienced troops rarely leads to a positive outcome. And I think I think the lead up to Zella teaches people that. Um, but yeah, then of course Caesar brings a, a small force over, reconstitutes the army, you know combines his force with the Pompeian veterans, brings up some new recruits and combines them with his existing veterans and then has a, a force by which he can then defeat Farnakis with. Um, but yeah, obviously we've talked about North Africa and about Munda. Um, so, I mean, is there much more to canvas about the civil war? Cause I mean, that basically sums it up in a nutshell. Um, um, not really, uh, but, not... uh, aside to say that I actually think arguably as impressive as Pharsalus is his victory at Thapsus. Thapsus is genius. The way he um he actually attacks the city from two sides and like lulls the Pompeians out into battle once again in the most disadvantageous position possible and actually defeats the he defeats Metellus Scipio and Cato outside the walls and then Juba who's the king of the Numidians is he actually escapes the battle he's not killed but he basically destroys two armies in one location it's an actually it's an absolute another masterclass by Caesar. Mm-mm. Yeah, so that's pretty much the civil war um, over, um, from uh, I think, and uh, so with sort of fullest criticism, you sort of agree, but but don't fully agree. 
Um, yeah, like I said, more the characteristic critique. Um, mm -hmm. And like the whole idea that, yes, he was faffing about in the Near East, but at the same time, you know, I think it's hard to criticize Caesar in terms of kind of the things that I've already hashed on before where, you know, Caesar had this capability of motivating men to do what would otherwise have been nine possible things, you know, that he's, he's a men fight with such determination and tenacity and, in like his men, like you got to think that, that leading up to Pharsalus, his men were on the verge of starvation. You know that the skirmish through Egypt, the the, the that sort of Delta campaign against them. I can't remember um, Ptolemy Thirteen's general. Um, you know the, this, the basically the general who was a, a, a put in place by his father uh, by Ptolemy Twelve. I just can't think of the general's name. Um, you know and and hands within that delicate situation of sort of politics and soldiers and being in a city and half besieged and everything, you know, C Caesar gets the absolute maximum of the people under him, which is really one of the leading is, is one of the fundamental qualities of leadership is being able to choose the right people and then getting the most out of them. And I think Caesar's arguably one of the great exemplars of that. In some ways, I think he actually, in many ways, I think he sees Napoleon. I think, it can be said that Napoleon got to a place where he like sat on his laurels a little bit and just got a bit, you know, take like Borodina for instance, where he just sort of headlong, you know, frontal assaults, not really thinking about the consequences for the future. Like Caesar doesn't really get, doesn't have that complacent phase. You might say he suffered that phase politically where he gets stabbed by his enemies who he showed clemency towards. But in terms of like a military leadership sense, Caesar does not get complacent. He does not sit on his laurels. Caesar is always, you know, adaptive and and intuitive and daring, and always somehow creates options for himself, even in the most dire of circumstances. And in the process of doing that, he extracts the absolute maximum intellectual, physical, and spiritual capability of the men who follow him. And that's a very rare quality in history. Mm, well, well, thanks for that, Marcus. So uh, now I think um, we should get on to. Um, the final bit in the uh, the Ides of March. So, yep. So after the War, lest we disappoint our audience who've been <laughs> hanging on for the Ides of March for two and a half hours. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So Caesar's declared. Um, he's initially declared dictator um, on a temporary basis, and then later he's then declared dictator for life. Um, while dictator, he, as you said, he gives clemency to a lot of the um, Senate. So like Brutus um, is one, Cicero is another. Um, so they, they're allowed back as senators again, they're, they're pardoned. Um, so yeah, so he's actually quite merciful to some of his old opponents. Uh, so well, really most of them, to be mm -hmm. honest, he actually doesn't put any of them to death, like in terms of the commanders mm -hmm. or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, I think it's interesting because obviously the last time you've had a Roman dictator, it was Sulla, and uh, Sulla was very much uh, not prone to showing clemency to his enemies. As um, what's that expression you you like to quote of his? Oh, um, yeah, the uh, no, um, no friend uh, has ever helped me, nor uh, any friend. Uh, harmed me whom I've not repaid in full something to that effect I can't remember I'll actually look it up because I want to get the phrase right but yeah and you got to think we, we know about the prescriptions by a Antony and Octavian which arguably were actually more extensive than um than uh than Sulla's prescriptions but really in the like the Roman political context it is Sulla who conceives of the idea of the political prescription you know that I am going to prescribe my enemies. I'm going to ruin them. I'll have them exiled. I'll kill them. I will, I will cleanse this Republic by any and all means necessary. It's kind of like, he's like a, a almost like a Robespierre just without the revolutionary spirit. You know how like Ro Robespierre, um, he, he, um, he, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, he, um, Oh, sorry. My, my English brain has stopped working. Um, he, uh, he sort of would boast that, the revolution will be attained, you know, no matter how many people we have to guillotine, right? Um, sort of Sulla's basically, I will cleanse the Roman Republic, no matter how many people I have to prescribe. <laughs> um, I don't know. I've got, so I've got the quote here, by the way. Okay, go for it. Yeah. No friend ever served me and no enemy ever wronged me whom I have not repaid in full. That is the based. basis of a political theory. <laughs> based, based, based. <laughs> oh, Sorry, what were you going to say, Hitman? 
Uh, oh, it's making me think of that um, Thomas Jefferson quote, that sometimes the tree of liberty has to be watered in the blood of tyrants and patriots. Not wrong. You know, in, in terms of analysing the world from a historical standpoint, like history has proven that to be, to be the case, and Jefferson's just making an accurate um, reflection of human history, you know? Mm. And, and this Republican period with its incredible instability, and we sort of touched on earlier, sort of like another tangent that we went on before, but this sort of massive instability of a system that was created in a time and place in a context that in which it worked, and it was, one might say, ideal because it led to such a, a high watermark, right? But its sort of collapse came in that sudden rise because once it became an empire and all what name, the system couldn't work. And so, you know, with this sort of, um, sort of atrophy of the system and then sort of it sort of, deviating and then being exploited by specific people who who would attain sort of rank and power and you know for for reasons would be they good or bad um demonstrated the insufficiency of the system and sort of sullers that first major step in that direction mm. well, as a purely as a purely value-free judgment i say that mm -hmm. yeah because um obviously so with caesar so he's much more merciful than than sulla was but also uh, if you think about it, you know, he's declared dictator for life, so clearly he's got longer term political ambitions. If he wants to stay um, the, the, the leader, he's not prepared to give up power back to the Senate, whereas Sulla was at least prepared to do so. But in fairness, Caesar was made there's a bit there's a bit of context to this. So Caesar, when he returns from Spain and after he's, you know, suppressed the civil war, he's you know defeated the civil war at Munda and he makes his way back to Italy. I believe he's appointed dictator for five years initially. And then it's doubled to 10 years. And then there's a proclamation, I believe, via the Tribune of Plebs. But it, it's sort of basically from the people. Whether it was massaged by the pro Caesarian forces, I guess we don't really know. But then Caesar is appointed dictator for life. And it's at that point where he's di appointed dictator for life is where there are people in Rome and in the aristocracy who basically see this as a violation of their birthright and their aristocratic privilege to partake and to engage in politics, as has been the right of their forefathers from the beginning of the Republic. Um, and people who were otherwise, to some degree, friends of Caesar uh, begin to engage in this conspiracy. And the worst thing is that you actually look at the people who ended up partaking in the in the deed, you know, Decius Brutus was a man who fought with Caesar from Bracte to Munda. That's not insignificant, you know. I mean, you could say, oh, Labienus bailed and went to the Optimates when Caesar, when the Civil War bro broke out. That's a bit different. But Decius Brutus fought with Caesar almost the entire way. And Decius Brutus, people, not, not, not many people know this, Decius Brutus, I think, was second or third in line to Caesar's estate as, as a potential... As, as a beneficiary of his will. And yet Decius Brutus was one of the men holding a dagger in the Senate house. Oh, well, it was actually Pompey's theater because the Senate was being renovated. But anyway, um, well, it was, Pom Pom sorry, it might be important to clarify. This is not the same as Marcus Junius Brutus, uh, the, the famous, you know, et tu Brutus. They, are, they, they, they I believe are second cousins, but they're not the same yeah, person. Yeah. yeah. Just want to make yeah, sure so, I find that to the yeah, audience. So. That clarification is important. But indeed, both Decius Brutus and Marcus Junius Brutus were among the conspirators, as were um, Cassius Longinus, um, you know, as were several other famed Romans. And very famously, the conspirators chose not to invite nor inform Cicero for, you know, I suppose reasons of pl plausibility. I don't, I don't necessarily know, or that maybe Cicero may have been too loose-lipped or... There's, it's hard to know why Cicero wasn't involved, um, but I think the liber the so-called liberators had their reasons for not asking Cicero. My belief is that in order to, in their mind, to establish a post-assassination legitimacy, with Cicero being the leading political man in Rome at this point, with the death of Cato and the death of Pompey, and you know the the, the you might say what has been a severe bloodletting of the optimates, Cicero is probably the last great man standing in the Senate. In the aftermath of this assassination of Caesar, I'm just presuming that's just my conclusion. Oh, well, I'm also thinking, um, especially if the um, HBO's Rome um, sort of presentation of Cicero, he's presented as being this very kind of, you know, a, a little bit foppish, 
effeminate kind of uh, man of letters. Like he's not really, you know, very martial or very yeah. strong willed, is he? Uh, a, 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 sque a squeamish, limp wristed kind of scholarly type, an orator, and yes. yeah, yeah. That may be part of it, but in the end, how much is historical em embellishment? We don't really know. Um, I mean, you got to think he did face the Catalan conspiracy face to face, and then when he was, uh, you know, eventually accosted by the second prescription and killed in his um, villa, he did confront the death with a degree of courage. So I don't know if he was perhaps as squeamish as people make him out to be. I, I dare say the show probably does that to sort of show this contrast between, you know, and Marcus Antonius the Brute and this soft pink hand scholarly, you know, lawyer, orator. Um, um, oh, but, in, 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 but in the end, we're trying to judge 2,000 years away from these events, so who actually knows? Yeah, but that, that's another great scene, though. It's like, Cicero, if I catch you around here ag again, I'm going to cut off your soft pink hands pink and nail them to the Senate's door! <laughs> yeah, it's great, isn't it? And James okay. Purifoy just just really hits the hits the mark with Anthony. It's it's a fantastic and, bit of acting, the, 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 the best performance in the whole show. Yeah, it was a wonderful. There's a wonderful YouTube video out there just called like Mark Anthony owning everyone. It's like all the bits of the show where he just <laughs> like Alpha dominates every character he comes across. It's pretty funny, but anyway, um, I digress. Yes, <clears throat> yeah. So anywho, so so Caesar becomes. Dictator for life, alienates most of the remaining senators who, who he's pardoned. They conspire against him and on the Ides of March, which is also important because I only, there's a little fact about this, which I only discovered recently, is that um, after addressing the Senate on the Ides of March, Caesar was actually planning on conducting a military campaign to Parthia. And so this... Basically, Two days away. Yeah, mm. so if they'd not acted then, it's very unlikely they ever would have got another opportunity. Um, because if Caesar had gone to Parthia and fought a campaign, now we've talked about the capabilities of Caesar and the capabilities of Crassus, but I'm personally doubtful as to how successful Caesar would have been against the Parthians. I mean, what's your thought? I actually think he, I take a different view. I think that he proved his worth against such an array of enemies. He proved it against the Gauls, he proved it against the Germans, he proved it against the Britons. Even though in the, the, the case of the latter two, he didn't actually make lasting conquest, he didn't annex territory, he still gained victory over them. He fought the son of Mithridates, you know, he sort of fights in this sort of Greco-Anatolian fashion. He prevailed in Egypt, prevailed in a civil war from a position of extreme disadvantage in many instances, and won. And only, you might say, in the in the context of Jojovia, in Gaul, prior to Elysia, and Dyrrhachium just prior to Pharsalus, Caesar only suffers two defeats, which can only actually be really called setbacks in the in the context of the campaigns analysed in their totality. Um, I think the only caveat I make is that if Caesar did in fact suffer epilepsy and if his epilepsy was worsening with age, whether that would have inhibited him in the hot climates of Parthia, I don't know. That's just a point of consideration because, you know, we have to con consider these things when it's an entertaining, you know, historical if-only what-ifs and counterfactuals, right? It's just a part of the equation. But I think Caesar, and, you know, very much um, like his campaign, even North Africa demonstrated this, you know, this sort of hopping between cities and that sort of skirmish with Labienus and fighting, you know, a tuba of um, Numidia and you know, just he, Caesar shows this a tactical aptitude no matter what conditions and circumstances he's subject to he sort of wriggles away to victory one way or another and I I think with the force that he had arrayed for Parthia which is estimated to be somewhere in the in the region of somewhere I've heard estimates as low as 10 but as many as 15 legions which is a, a force that Caesar never actually uh, commanded in, in, a, in a general pitched battle um and given the talent of his subordinates, because if Caesar was good at one thing, it was choosing good subordinates and giving them the the initiative and the the leadership and the the control to you know the to, the responsibility to conduct their affairs unimpeded, and in fact encouraged the aptitude that he himself showed. Um, I actually think he probably would have done well in 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 Parthia. Moreover, I think it would have been the thing that had he actually done it, it would have elevated him undoubtedly above alexander 
moreover, I wonder how much different world history would be that if if Rome ended up being, you know, Rome as we know it today in the historical maps, plus a large chunk of what Alexander had accomplished all in the one entity. I wonder firstly how how it could have been governed because you're really starting to sort of stretch the limits of administrative and bureaucratic capacity and even from a military standpoint of overextension. Um, but oh. I, I actually, I, I think personally Caesar would have done it in, in my mind. I, I just don't think that if you're talking, say, Sassanid Persia, which had a more solid bureaucracy and a better army and were more tenacious and were a more aggressive opponent, I would probably call it more of a coin flip. But I think personally, as for myself, not that I can ever prove it, but I would, I would say, if I was just to have to make a guess on it, I would say Caesar would have actually prevailed in Parthia, and I, and he would have prevailed with probably not too much difficulty. Well, thank you for for that explanation and, and your thoughts there, Marcus. But I've just had the thought. Um, obviously, as we mentioned earlier, with Plutarch, the life of Caesar, um, he's the parallel life is Alexander the Great. Uh, in a way, though Caesar lamented. He felt like he'd not achieved as much as Alexander did in such a short space of time. Um, at least in one respect, um, Caesar's legacy was much more longer lasting because, you know, when Caesar um, is assassinated, he's got Augustus. Augustus is able to keep the empire together and expand it to its heights, whereas Alexander the Great dies and his whole empire rips itself apart. Well, one could say, in all honesty, that the last vestige of Alexander's empire vanishes in the the first decade bc the the oh, final destruction oh, yes. of the the final destruction of the indo-greek kingdom right so mm -hmm. at its absolute most alexander's last vestige doesn't outlast him 300 years right if you're being if you're being sort of particularly strict you could say that caesar's legacy lasts till you know the the disposition of romulus augustulus and the you know the, the loss of western rome to the bug to the barbarians and and Ottavasa, you know to becoming king of the ostrogoths in italy which you know takes you to what you know like four 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 ten four four five three you know that first sort of half century the the fifth century um or if you want to be extremely dramatic you know some people say that rome fell in 1453 and if you're talking Byzantium, the last vestiges of Byzantium were conquered in 1461, if you want to be uber technical, um, which is a much longer lasting legacy by any stretch of the imagination. But even if you just take the strict West Roman sense, you know, Caesar lived in the first century BC uh, and died in 33 BC, obviously. Um, Rome falls in the mid fifth century. I mean, that's a legacy of half a millennia. It outlasts. And also in terms of breadth of scale, you got to think all those territories that that uh, Alexander conquered, you know, Bactria, Aracosia, Gedrosia, um, Susania, you know, Alam, Assyria, back, you know, I think I mentioned Bactria, but, you know, you know Armenia, Upper Syria, Lower Syria, Cappadocia, um, Phrygia have all been lost to Greek civilization. Whereas Rome, you know, if you think that we still have Romance language, you know, people of, of you know, from Portugal and Spain and France and Switzerland and Italy, uh, and to some degree, maybe even the Croats, you know, if you're really drawing a long bow, you can claim descent. And to some, in some regards, you can even say the Greeks claim like a, a shared, um, certainly cultural identity and historical identity with Rome. Um, it's more than could be said for Alexander's legacy. Now, that might be a contentious take. I completely accept responsibility for that. But, I mean, I think in that sense, the Caesarian legacy far is far more enduring historically than Alexander's. Yeah, no, no I, would, I would certainly agree with that. Hmm. So, yeah. Maybe, I mean, I know we're pushing on three hours now, but should we maybe try and round out this stream with, because uh, we, we obviously earlier in the stream sort of made the whole, like, particularly in Caesar's adolescence and his formative years, we sort of did these sort of Trump v. Caesar comparisons. Should we perhaps round this conversation off with perhaps like a definition of Caesarism or maybe some of the the mainstream uh, 
uh, citations of what people consider Caesarism to be or where we see Caesarism misused? I mean, I mean, it's your stream, it's your channel. I mean, where do you want to go with this? Because I think we should try and round this off on a, on a nice note. And for people who um either want to know what Caesarism is or feel that there are people who misuse Caesarism, how can we perhaps correct the record from a historical standpoint? Um, wh what do you want to do, Hitman? Well, what I'd like to do is there's a passage from Decline of the West by Oswald Spengler, which I would like to read because um, he's the oh, I forgot the to... I forgot the Spengler quotes. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so because Spengler is the one who coins the term Caesarism uh, in Decline of the West. And so I'm just finding the passage that I want. So, okay. Okay, so this is in volume two. And even this much resulted in the inward form of Rome, the last which had remained upright, melting in the Grocan disorders, and what is unparalleled elsewhere, it was not between states that the final rounds of the battle for Imperium were fought, but between the parties of a city. The form of the polis allowed of no other outcome. Of old it had been Sparta versus Athens, now it was Optimate versus Popular Party. In the Grocan Revolution, which was already heralded by a first servile war, the younger Scipio was secretly murdered, and C. Gracchus openly slain. The first who was princeps, and the first who was tribune, were political centres in themselves amidst the world become formless. In 104, the other masses of Rome, for the first time lawlessly and tumultuously, invested a private person, Marius, with Imperium. The deeper importance of the drama then enacted is comparable with that of the assassination of the mythic emperor title by the ruler of Sin in 288. The inevitable product of the age, Caesarism, suddenly outlines itself on the horizon. The heir of the tribune was Marius, who, like him, linked mob and high finance, and in 87, murdered off the old aristocracy in masses. The heir of the princeps was Sulla, who in 82 annihilated the class of the great merchants by his prescriptions. Thereafter, the final decisions press on rapidly, as in China, after the emergence of Wang Chen. Pompey, the princeps, and Caesar, the tribune, tribune not in office but in attitude, were still party leaders, but nevertheless, already at Lucca, they were arranging with Crassus and each other for the first partition of the world amongst themselves. When the heirs of Caesar fought his murderers at Philippi, both had ceased to be more than groups. By Actium, the issue was between individuals, and Caesar will out even in such a process as this. Yes, yeah, so what's your um, thoughts on that passage, Marcus? Oh, sorry, my um, my internet just blanked out. Um, I I I heard the bit up to um, the the murders of the brothers Gracchi. Uh, sorry, just because I my internet just briefly cut out. Can you just read that last part again from the brothers Gracchi? Uh, <clears throat> sure. So, uh, yeah. So when in one o four, the urban masses of Rome for the first time lawlessly and monstrously invested a private person, Marius with Imperium. The deeper importance of the drama then enacted is comparable with that of the assumption of the mythic emperor title by the ruler of Sin in 288. The inevitable product of the age, Caesarism, suddenly outlines itself on the horizon. The heir of the tribune was Marius, who, like him, linked mob and high finance, and in 87 murdered off the old aristocracy in masses. The heir of the princeps was Sulla, who in 82 annihilated the class of the great merchants by his prescriptions. Thereafter, the final decisions press on rapidly, as in China, after the emergence of the of Wang Chen, Pompey the princeps and Caesar the tribune, tribune not in office but in attitude, were still party leaders, but nevertheless, already at Lucca, they were arranging with Crassus and each other for the first partition of the world amongst themselves. When the heirs of Caesar fought his murderers at Philippi, both had ceased to be more than groups. By Actium, the issue was, be was between individuals, and Caesarism will out even in such a process as this. Mm, interesting. I find it interesting how Spengler kind of sees. Um, I mean, he. I think. I think the definition of Caesar as the Tribune, by character, not by nature, is is factual. Um, but and this is where I find it difficult. I mean, for all intents and purposes, I see. You know, I I I, I get the principles of vanguardism, and I see it's it's um. You know its uses or elite theory and and the, the definitions are pretty sound and they uh and the way that they describe these things occurring in the world make a lot of sense to me but 
I guess in our frame, don't know if this necessarily applies to Spengler, but um, there's a seminal problem of hostile elites. And I don't necessarily think that like the mass are bad in that the mass exist. And I guess it is people living within a given ethnos or a culture or, or, or language group or whatever the, the outlines are, because I mean, these vary all across history and, and it's, and, and sort of pre pre medieval Italy, sort of like classical and ancient Italy is a really interesting example this, you know, with the, with the, with the Romans themselves and their Italic neighbors and then the Oscans and the Messapians in the South and, and then sort of Sicily being, you know, part, mostly, you know, you know, portion Greek, portion Phoenician, port, portion Siculian, who was sort of like this um, paleo Sicilian and Italic melding of people in like the, the extreme northwest of the island um, make for a great sort of demonstration of this, all, all of those differences. Um, um, the, the, what, what I want to say is that, um, you know, I don't necessarily think... Uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. I understand the principle of the low and the high unite, un, uh, the low and the high uniting against the middle makes perfect sense, particularly like in the, if you to use the Dutton notion of like the midwits and the middle class being these aspirational wanker types and AA's done a video on that. And you know, it's, it's, it's apt and it's fitting and it's true. Um, but in the context of say like an older pre-modern country that existed sort of pre the French revolution and this sort of ideology of, of this active intellectualized and rationalized ideology of sort of subversion and sort of you know, purposeful erosion of, of, of institutions and, and um, you know, doing it through this sort of open air quotes, enlightenment framework and ra rational framework, um, you know, in the sort of Rousseauian Robespierre sort of sense. Um that, like I said, the middle, the, 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 you know, middle, you know, the people in the middle, the citizens aren't necessarily good or bad. They just exist. And I mean, if, you know, if, if they didn't exist, there would not be a society. There would not be a culture. You know, the, the very first people who inhabited Sumeria and Acadia wouldn't have built the first walls, you know, if it weren't the people, if you get what I mean, you know, like society exists not in a vacuum, but for a purpose. Um, the point, I, I, I guess, I, I'm, I, I can't. I, I largely agree, and then like Spengler. But what, I, what I have difficulty reconciling is, is that, you know, is everybody in the middle necessarily bad? And say Sulla being the princeps, you know, and and he dissolved the what would you call that, the, the money merchant class with his prescriptions. But how much is that actually true? In the end, what we do know. And this is where the Roman situation really requires careful study of the Roman period and of Roman history is that what you have is this kind of what we see in our modern world of this mismanagement in part willful, in part incidental of elites, some more or less complicit than others of engaging in malfeasance by which other people bear the cost. And with the Roman example, we, you mentioned at the very beginning or near the beginning, we talked about the Mari reforms and how Gaius Marius reformed the army in the context of the, or rather the consequences of the first part of the Cimbrian War. And when the Rome, the Mari reforms took place, I mean, Rome was in a very much a, a precarious position, one or two more defeats, and there essentially wouldn't have been an army to have blocked the Cimbrians from attacking Rome itself. Um, hence, his motivations for the reform um of, of of the roman army from that sort of levy levied man, manipular semi-professional militia system to a fully fledged fully fledged professional army a standing army with legions out in the field at all times with standardized equipment and standardized you know uniform training and drill etc um um i think it might be worth um, maybe giving a bit more context to spengler so what you need to remember with him is that he's got this um, view of civilization as like an organism. It's like a flower. So you've got the seasons, you've mm. got spring, summer, autumn, mm. and winter. The mm. Spring through to autumn is the cult culture or culture phase, and then winter is the mm -hmm. civilizational phase. Mm. So with the first three, it's where, it's where all the energy and vitality is, and mm. winter is where everything gets very stiff and very rational. And yeah. with the things he was talking about there, 
Um, it's almost like a crystallization period, isn't it? Yes, and th this is the thing with with these figures: this print, the princeps figure and the tribune figure. Whereas in the past, Rome people were loyal to the idea of Rome or to the Senate and would fight mm. and die for Rome. Now you're fighting in. The, the, so it's, it's, it's that it's, it's that it's that Chestertonian case of like Rome wasn't great. Uh, sorry, men uh, men didn't love Rome because she was great. She became great because men loved her. Yes, and um, there's another passage in Decline where Spengler says that literally men men didn't fight and die for Rome anymore. They fought, fought and died for Marius or Sulla or Caesar. Mm. They became loyal to these individuals, not the idea of the civilization itself. And, Which I agree with, actually. Um, yes, and um, he also says that in this sort of civilizational winter phase, everything becomes about money and power. There's no more higher ideals anymore. It's all just degenerative. The tangible over the intangible, the physical yes. over the spiritual. Yeah, correct. And I agree with both of those takes. But the point I'm trying to make is that there's this, and we face. I kind of rambled a bit before, and I was I was leading somewhere, and and just sort of try and tighten that circle again. What we've seen in the modern age, and and we are living through that kind of a period where you know politicians can run their mouth off and talk about oh we should send weapons here and we should you know invade this territory and you know um, you know this group's doing this in Afghanistan and this people doing that in Iraq and this person's a dictator and that person's a tyrant in Libya and Iraq and you know wherever you know we we know what we're talking about I don't have to elaborate, elaborate anymore right. But it's never their children that come home in body bags. You know, they're the ones who still have shares in defense companies that make squillions of dollars. And um, and then the electorate still votes them in no matter how many mistakes or screw ups they make. There's a sort of like a no penalty system for 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 error. Um, and, you know, to quote Thomas Sewell, you know, could you think of a more insensible system or whatever his quote is you know that where you, you create a system by which the people who have power and have responsibility don't bear consequences for their errors he's absolutely right um not um, not that i'm not, not that i'm a libtard but i'm just saying like that quote mm -hmm. does actually ring true across any system of authority that has governance and bureaucracy um in the roman context where this matters is that that roman system where it sort of moved into the marine system that happened because the Roman lander classes had been eviscerated by Rome's constant warfare ever since the end of the Punic Wars. Um, Rome celebrates something in the order of a couple, uh, I can't remember, what was it, like 30, 40 triumphs in 200 years? And as I said at the start of the stream, a, a triumph was never issued to a, a general had he killed less than 5,000 of the enemy. So... You didn't just get a triumph for just like rocking up and you know, uh, you know, slaying a few you know bandits on a beachside or in a cave somewhere. Like you actually had to engage the enemy in a decisive battle and defeat them and kill them. Um, and Rome's expansion was, you know, from that Second Punic War onwards was was fast and vigorous and often you know the spontaneous decisions of succession, the successive generals with whatever forces they had at the disposal and their sort of you know, the independent inclinations and, and drive and, and situations that they found themselves in, you know, Pompey in the East and Caesar in Gaul and, you know, Lucullus in, in Anatolia as well. And, um, you know, Scipio, um, well, Scipio Africanus defeating, obviously, um, uh, Hannibal outside of Zama, but then his descendant, uh, Scipio Alamanus, you know, actually destroying Carthage and annexing Africa into Gaul, and then Marius obviously fighting the, Jugur the, uh, the, uh, the Numidian War, the Jugurthine War, just prior to the Cimbrian War breaking out, um, you know, Flamininus and the Greek Wars of Liberation before the Romans then annex Macedonia and Greece outright. Um, you know, these are just the successive decisions of all these men with no sort of cogent central centralized strategy, and yet Rome still expands rapidly because its its internal systems are are, are strong and robust. Like you say, it's that sort of spring period that's highly energetic, um, but. The people who bear the cost for this are the are the landed, you know, citizen soldiers of Rome. Um, they are the ones who find their manpower poor or diminishing, and their demographics eviscerated. And then by the time Caesar comes around, this is where I think populism shouldn't be completely dismissed by people who delve into elite theory. Is that the people have a right to be mad when their elites. They're the elites whom are hostile to their interests lead them astray and use the state for their own purposes to line their pockets at the expense of citizens. I guess this is like the interesting point where populism and elite theory 
diametrically cross each other. Um, and the thing is with the the Roman, you know, the, the landed citizenry is that with their continuous attrition in all these wars, which then reaches its 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 um, apogee in the aftermath of the disasters of the Cimbrian Wars, you know, after their the defeats at um oh I'm trying to think of the name of the battle where they were, they were uh, completely destroyed um at the Alps um by the Amberones and the Teutones, I can't remember. I've just, I've, just, I've just gone blank on the Cimbrian Wars here. Um but the Roman landed class is eviscerated. They the Romans are almost at a point where they can't raise more armies. They can raise armies from the the so called um head count you know the, the the people living in the cities but these landed citizen soldiers which are the backbone of not only the roman army but the roman state and the roman economy are basically no more they vanished in 200 years of constant roman campaigning and so mm -hmm. in the in the aftermath what's happened rome has been as they've attained victory what have they also attained slaves and the aristocrats the hostile elite have acquired vast swaths of very productive italian agricultural land and rather than small communities, sufficient farmers tilling their soil and forming communities and, you know, building families and their own, you know, real economic value, not to make this a, 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 a material argument, I don't mean that, I'm talking just like people being able to live a life that is their own and exists within a, 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 a logical and, a, um, you know, like a, like a heartfelt context, you know, like the, the, the matching of the intangible and the tangible, right? this class is almost eviscerated right and then the aristocrats buy all this land penny on the dime or in this case this is this is to the denarii right um and you know the, 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 thus we see the the arising of the latter you know, the, the you know these the sort of slave estates that's yeah, come yeah. that's pro that's what these where these hostile elites have profited to the total they've profited from the complete evisceration of an entire demographic of people now, this is where I think Spengler and people like him have overlooked the Roman question. And I think most people in our circles actually do. And although I myself, I see the, the uh, you might say, the virtues of elite theory and where it's actually truthful, whenever they cite Rome, they miss this. It's the class betrayal of the the not haves by the hostile elites and i think it requires a little bit more investigation and discussion by people in our in our spheres mm, well thank you very much for that marcus um yeah so just to add on to your comment about latifundia it's almost as if the elites are bringing in um lots of um foreign born people shall we say and um you've got these groups of sort of atomized sort of laborers who are just doing these this, this dead-end nihilistic work right precisely um so, sorry i know just as i was finishing that i did i did inadvertently cut you off i, I apologize it man um it just if i hadn't got that point out it took me a while to get there i didn't want to forget it um but but exactly right uh, and this is where you know if you look at say um this early roman state uh, i mean although that being said rome was hugely wasteful in a manpower sense in the particularly well both punic wars but especially the second one i mean god how many roman armies were massacred by hannibal uh, uh they got away bloodied at uh, at Tinicus and Trebia River. The army's totally destroyed at Trasimene, and most of the army, a very big army, Cana, is is you know is killed on the field of battle. Is just totally destroyed. Only a few thousand men escape with their lives. Um, doesn't bode well for the future for Rome. Um, and and in the end, like I said, you know what 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 you know what, what losses do those whom the powers to be suffer for consequences that they have like in the end to make again to make a a modern day example you know with, with this with what happened in afghanistan you know just what a year ago 18 months ago whenever it was who's been sacked who in the pentagon paid a price for that who in political circles paid a price for that you know if if, the, if that was if that was the early days of the roman republic or if that was say in in um in athens they would have been ostracized literally they would have been exiled or, or or prosecuted but you know it's it's it we live in a kind of time where if you and i incorrectly file a tax return we're going to be locked you know we get we get shafted by the system very very strongly I'm not, uh, and i encourage no one to do such thing obviously do what's legal and pay your taxes but 
the point I make, if we make we, if we make an error incidentally or like there's some kind of a mistake or, you know, we lose enough road points in our license, like, oh, you can't drive anymore. But if politician does it, then they don't suffer the consequences. Whereas really leadership should work inversely. You know, Caesar at any point in any of those battles that he fought could have died, but he was with his men and led them from the front and didn't expect it from him. You know what I mean? We just don't have elites like that anymore. And so I think there's this, as much as the, I suppose maybe you can consider the Roman class as the low with the aristocratic high and maybe the middle something else. But I don't know. I think the water's muddy as to what categorizes low and middle. You know what I mean? I don't think it's particularly easy to ascertain that. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm happy to be corrected. But um, Well, just going off your um, comment about um, leaders not paying the price of their actions, it makes me think of them... Um... Obviously, um, you know, Quintus Varus, you know, the um, commander at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, you know, after he's tricked by Arminius and three Roman legions are massacred and destroyed, you know, he didn't get to just retire. He had he committed suicide because that's what he would have expected to have done. He would brought shame, um, you know, and defeat upon legions of Rome. So he did had to do what was the most honourable thing in that situation. He couldn't just, you know, mm. run, run away and retire peacefully. Precisely, yeah. And, and although that being said, so I think Tudor Bog Forest is a is a not extreme example, but I dare say if he, even Arminius had survived, what are the chances of he, him making it back to Roman territory? Um, and if he'd survived, the Germans have captured him. What would they have done to him? There's probably also that consideration as well. But at least you might say in the in the old world context, he did what was honourable. Um, Whereas nowadays, generals on TV have a lot of badges and colours on their shirts, and what have they actually accomplished? You know. <laughs> oh, the, you um, oh, oh, you brought um, oh, you brought some some new diverse officers in today. Oh, you were uh, you in sort of transgender bathrooms in the barracks? Here's another medal. Exactly right. You know, it's um, you know, when you consider that there was opposition in the Pentagon or what the, the predecessor of the Pentagon was to Patton getting his third star. And Patton was arguably the most effective American general. I mean, he had his vices, but Patton was a man who, who could eviscerate an enemy and had the kind of attitude that we're sort of talking about, that, you know, you can sort of compare to Caesar or, or I mean, even though him and Rommel are quite different personalities, there's a reason why him and Rommel actually re respected each other is because they have that sort of, personality and that drive and that ability to command and to sort of if you're given a force what can you do with it you know I, I, I for instance i couldn't think of another american commander that could have undertaken operation cobra like Patton did in normandy where he just you know totally broke out of the normandy salient and just tore through german opposition where you know monty who was meant to capture khan on the first or second day was still stuck there you know a month later um, you know, plodding around the, the, um, I'm trying to think what river that is that goes through Con. I've just gone blank, but yeah, you know, Those Monty just sort of, I thought it was the Seine, but um, yeah, I think it is the Seine river. I, I was going to say Seine, I just didn't want to say it if I was wrong, but I think it is the Seine. I think you're right. Um, you know, uh, but you know, uh, Patton, you know, got his head down, motivated the troops, you know, and because he was a, sort of like this offensively ori and tenacious minded man, break out of that, that encirclement, he captured Sherborne, got the port and just tore through the Germans. Um, in fairness, and I have to sort of make this point is that obviously the vast majority of the German armored divisions and particularly not, you know, the veteran divisions of, you know, what um, were deployed to the east of the Normandy salient, but irrespective, he, you know, he still had to make his way through the Bocage and he still had to make his way through what was quite favorably defensive territory and, you know, cut a, a bloody path through the Germans. Um, you know, Rommel you know, again in Africa, you know, reinforced the Africa Corps with two German divisions and a handful of Italian divisions that ended up actually capturing Tobruk and, you know, made it all the way to El Alamein. I, maybe there were Germans who could have done that because, I mean, the Germans had more of that spirit in their army from like the you know the general german general staff sense you know the, perhaps guderian would have done that perhaps uh, you know perhaps modul would have done that perhaps manstein would have done that who knows you know could live in this world of counterfactual forever um you know uh, and, and again like you know napoleon you know would would someone other than napoleon have done austerlitz or 
um, Ulm or um, Alstadet and uh, the twin battle to Alstadet. I've just gone blank, but you know, um, it just you know, people like that have a certain disposition, and uh, I don't know if um, you know, if if, uh, if that really exists in these people that we're talking about, I would say no. You know, uh, uh, what's, my, what's my point is that, you know, like you have people who argue against the citation and meritorious reward for people like that. I mean, I know Rommel was given a field marshal because he was um, sort of Hitler's favorite for a while. Um, but Guderian was never made a field marshal, even though Guderian wrote Achtung Panzer and eventually from the ground up nearly devised German armored warfare, the operational, ba you know, the operational basis for how Germans would fight armored warfare and, and mechanized warfare in the second world war. Uh, he wasn't made a field marshal. Uh, like I said, um, Patton, you know, struggled to get his third star. In fact, there's a lot of bureaucratic opposition to it. Why? Cause braggadocious and the loud mouth and, you know, a bit brutish, but he got the job done. Um, meanwhile, we just have generals who lose in Iraq and lose in Afghanistan and, you know, lose in Vietnam and, you know, the moment, you know, a handful of body body bags come out of Mogadishu, they, you know, pack up and leave Somalia, you know, just why do these generals have decorations? Yet they're still there. You know, it's it's a very strange dynamic we live in. Yes. No, it is certainly strange. But um yeah, we've been going for about three hours and twenty minutes, Marcus. Are there any final comments you want to uh, you want to make? Um well, I've, I'm sorry. I've I've probably talked more than I should on this stream. Um, like I said, it's a pity that Columba couldn't join us, but we, we've we've hopefully done well. I hope I hope I've answered your questions and queries to the best of my ability, um, and that we've touched on the important things. In the end, it, it is Caesarism cannot be divorced from Caesar. Actually, I, I do have a finishing point about this. this, this specific things i was actually talking about with this with my dad actually only, only a few weeks ago um mm -hmm. and and it's it's this idea that in political circles you can listen to any number of commentators and they'll throw around caesarism i'm not necessarily that i'm not saying they're doing this incorrectly or perhaps insincerely it's not what i'm getting at but that i think sometimes we use like oh the rubicon as this um <clears throat> what do you call it? You know, a bit of a throwaway term is it's like, oh, you know, Trump didn't cross the Rubicon, Bolsonaro didn't cross the Rubicon, you know, and I understand the analogy and it's not necessarily wrong, right? But the Rubicon and Caesar himself crossing it in the manner that he did within his particular circumstance is one of the greatest hinge points of Western history. In fact, I'd even say all of history for that matter. And moreover, it's not just, oh, I'm doing something and, you know, carpe diem, you know, trust least the future or, or just, you know, like, oh, for the hell of doing it, just, you know, not to cheapen your, your, your stream hitman, but you know, oh, YOLO across the river. It's like, no, no, no. Had Caesar lost, his entire family would have been, you know, basically, if not prescribed, would have been completely crushed by the Roman state and the, and the optimatus faction all of his troops would have been liable for either some degree of prosecution or imprisonment, or, I mean, maybe they would have defected, who knows. But it was Caesar with a skeletal force of veterans who had made their, who had survived the, the Gallic War, crossing the river, and the moment they did that, each and every one of them became criminals in the eyes of the Roman bureaucracy and the Roman government and the senators and, you know, most people in the Roman elite, they had no choice but to win. And so much would ride on the future of Rome, never mind just the people involved, but on the future of the state itself, depending on who actually won. There was so much at stake. And there's any point in time that one side or the other could have lost or prevailed over the other side. But history obviously played out as it did. And we can talk about counter counterfactuals too until we turn black and blue in the face and the cows come home. But again, maybe that's a part two for another time in the future. Needless to say, <clears throat> you know, I don't mind Caesarism being utilized as like a, a phraseology or, or, or a reference to, you know, a particular kind of, you know, oh, this person should have crossed the Rubicon or this person didn't or, you know, whatever. But I think it would do people who do political commentary or who are into history or like to make historical comparisons to modern day 
situations and 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 people and circumstances to understand what is at the heart of caesarism to understand the people who were around caesar whilst he personified the act of caesarism that spengler then goes on to define um yeah you know, i i just think not enough people perhaps go there uh and i think it would make their analyses of politics better and it make their political judgment better not to say it's poor but i'm just saying i think it would improve it for them to truly understand at its heart caesarism and the people primarily the person in this case gaius julius caesar as the man responsible for personifying it and making that term reality in our modern day mm. Well, because on the back of that, um, just going back to Spengler again, um, Spengler, um, obviously, when in that book, Decline of the West, he talks about all the different sort of great cultures or civilizations. Um, each sort of um, culture has its own um, sort of unique spirit. And he, he says this unique spirit of the classical Greco-Roman or the Apollonian man, as he calls it, borrowing a term from, uh, from Nietzsche, um, is sort of the here and now and the present. You know, classical classical man has no concept of the past or the future they live in the here and now and therefore they tend to operate in, in that respect and i think that helps explain what the actions of caesar he was a man living in the present the here and the now he had to act and that's why he and his men followed followed him um, so in our culture which is um very much far removed moved from then um perhaps it'll be much harder and that's probably why we've seen the falterings of that with people like um, Trump and Bolsonaro, they just don't have the same spirit or the same concept of what Caesar or the ancients had. Also, also as well, is that if Caesar had lost or Caesar had have buckled at the last minute, right, he would not have displaced people who were taking, and this is where like like, like the, the, the Tribune Principate argument sometimes doesn't actually hold traction, is that, I'm of the opinion that Caesar was doing more for his supporters than what the Optimates were doing for their supporters. The Optimates were more serving their own interests specifically as a class, where Caesar, I think, actually had his own followers and his own people's concerns to some degree at heart, even though he also was protecting his own personal interests. I think the two things existed symbiotically in Caesar. Um, yes, um, yeah, I would agree. And, and the other thing is as well is that to what degree would this malfeasance have continued had Caesar not crossed the Rubicon? You know, to what degree would the senatorial classes have just continued to self-serve themselves and indulge in a system that was only causing demographic, uh, a, a demographic calamity within Rome itself? And like I said, you had this, you had this total demographic evisceration of the landed pleasant peasant classes that was once the backbone of Roman society, the Roman economy, of you know the Roman state, and its identity to some degree. Because, I mean, the Romans always saw themselves as more of an agrarian people rather than an urban people. Rome sort of only became synonymous with city building. And, you know, if you, could, if you account the... If I may um, derive a thought from the wonderful British scholar Andrew Wallace Hadrop, who's probably my favourite Roman historian, if the Greeks invented the idea of the polis, it's the Romans who conceived the idea of the kiwis, you know, the, the city and the citizen. And it's only sort of around this... It's only when the Republic becomes, you might say, it's, it, it hits its springtime straps, you know, like it's, you know, it's a next Macedon, it's it's trebled its its uh, treasury, it's, you know, brought in all these rich Anatolian cities, it's got the mines of Spain, and it's this burgeoning power with lots of energy. Rome becomes a massive city. It becomes a larger city for, you know, over a millennia. Like, n nothing reaches a million people until, like, the, the Industrial Revolution, essentially, or just before that. Um... <clears throat> Um, and then the second biggest city is Constantinople, which, you know, again, nearly, it approaches a million, but doesn't quite get there. It's definitely over half a million. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we, we sort of associate the Romans with being like the sophisticated city builders and you know, aqueducts and bathhouses and, you know, cobbled streets and Rome's and marble stone, all this sort of stuff, right? But, you know, you look at the way, say, Cicero wrote about the Ma Mos Maiorum and, you know, about notions of, um, you know, of, of virtus, you know, of, of manliness or you like when Cato is distressing at what the annexation of Macedon and the Eastern provinces has done to Rome, how all this money has ruined the Roman, again, to use the Bapism, this Roman biospirit that is very, that is 
more frugal than the Greeks. It's more manly than the Greeks. It's more down to earth than the Greeks. It's more, um, you know, it's, it's more, um, I'm just trying to think of the actual word. Like it's, it's more visceral and, you know, more, um, more earthly than the Greeks. Maybe earth is not the right word, but you know what I'm trying to get at, you know, like the, 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 the sort of the, the heroic sort of farmer soldier type that the Romans loved about themselves. It, it vanishes knows, in, in, in a couple of centuries, you know, it, you know, by, by even Caesar's time, that notion of what a Roman is vanishes that sort of toga wearing urbanites thereafter. So I, th I think there's some interesting places we could discuss this in the future and expand upon it, but it's definitely worth talking about. And I appreciate you for having me on and I'm sorry I've taken three and a half hours of your time, um, oh, but no, I was not kidding. Uh, I was not kidding when I said that Julius Caesar was among my favorite subjects. Um, no, it clearly shows, Marcus, and this has been a, a wonderful conversation, so thank you. Um, yeah, so that's the end of the, the conversation. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed. Um, as much as I'd like to stay and take, take any questions, and uh, we've been going for three and a half hours, and I'm really, really hungry, and I think Marcus wants to go to bed as well. So uh, so anything you want to show, Marcus, before we... Sorry? I was going to say, I actually don't think we've been. I know we've had a we've had a modest audience of like half a dozen very valiant people who've dropped in and out and stuck around, but I don't think we actually received any questions. I'm just scrolling the chat. I don't think um, our our friends here have actually posted anything. So, um, well, there was one earlier about um, why did the empire decline for infiltration, and I said well, they kind of let the um, the barbarians oh, yeah, in, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we did touch on that. Um, yeah. But maybe, maybe, maybe down the track, if we do like a reflections and Caesarism stream, you know, like a like a non official part two, we can perhaps touch on that. Um, mm, and I hope, and I hope for anyone who's listened to the entirety three and a half hours of this, uh, I, I hope you haven't been bored. I, I hope we've tried to make this as entertaining as a grinding, very extensive historical subject can be. Um, but you know, like I said to you, literally Caesar, Julius, Gaius Julius Caesar, one of my favorite historical figures. You know, and yeah, he certainly is an all sunshine and rainbows. He's he's got some sides to his personality that aren't particularly, um, you know, nice or appealing or even admirable. But he's truly one of the titans of Western history, and I think, like Alexander, um, he's a man who had he not existed western history would be quite different and i think western history is made greater for him ha actually having lived his life the way he did and i think caesar you know for as long as humans write and read and entertain history as a subject will be one of the truly standout peoples uh, and and his legacy to date has been enduring i mean a lot of people don't realize that um you know he was alive 200, sorry, 2000 and nearly 200 years ago. And Romans still to this day go to his statue of the forum and lay flowers on his birthday. Make of that what you will. Ave Caesar. Ave Kaiser. Mori turi te salutant. Thank you, Hitman. I, I really appreciate this opportunity to chat about a subject that I adore, and I hope I've done it the utmost justice I can. And for those who do are listening, I hope you've enjoyed it also. And um, indeed, if an opportunity comes up to expand upon this, or maybe if we do a group discussion, I, I, I really hope that perhaps, um, you know, I don't know if AA's got three and a half hours to listen to this entire thing, but, you know, whether some guys, some friends in our circle, you know, whether it's, you know, Oron or Prudentialist or something might listen to this. I think we can actually nub into Caesarism, you know, this sort of dynamic between the history of Caesar and and Caesarism and then the political conception of it. I think there's there's places we can expand upon it for sure. So thank you for opening up that um, Pandora's box, Hitman. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Well, I hope that this is, well, I don't think this has been quite so uh, destructive or chaotic as Pandora's box. I would hope it's been rather fruitful and productive, so... Um, Poor yeah, analogy on my part, I apologise. But you're quite fine. right. Uh, but, um, yes, this whole idea of the, of the duality of Caesarism, I think that's definitely something, something that can be expanded upon. Mm, absolutely. Totally agree. Well, uh, well, is there anything you'd like to show before we leave? Uh, no, not really. Um, all going well. I might be with Mr. Jay Burden uh, tomorrow, probably similar time, actually. Um because I, I do have some family stuff to attend to tomorrow morning. Um, uh, and uh, I think AA and I are going to do a 
uh, a stream, we're going to talk about, uh, funnily enough, on Italian subjects, I think we're going to touch on uh, football, um, like historically speaking. So we're going to have a little chat about that um, because I'll be, I'll, I'll be a bit um, MIA later half of the month. I'm doing sort of farmer stuff again. So I'll be out of the city for a little while. Um, but I was going to say, I, I just glanced up actually, and it was 33333. Three, 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 three. So um, since we've just crossed over to 334, um, I'll leave it there. Um, you know, obviously, if you if you like what I've had to say or you like the stream, please follow me. Uh, and I insist, nay, nay, demand that you also follow Hitman. Um, this is our third stream together now, actually. Um, I thoroughly enjoy it. Obviously, Hitman and I have obviously been on the same streams with Mr. Apostolic Majesty as well. Um, but Hitman definitely deserves more likes and more follows. If you don't follow him, I will be mad and I will, uh, I'll prescribe you. So <laughs> please follow and like it, man. Um, no, that's all. Just thank you very much, sir. And I can't wait for the next one. Thank you, Marcus. Um, in terms of uh, future streams, um, I'm in the process of trying to get one arranged with Panama Hat. Um, we've already did one on Mind of Travel by Peter Kemp. But the next other one I'm trying to arrange with him is going to be on the present time by Thomas Carlyle. We're just trying to get a date and time sorted, but, but that will be um, fascinating to go over. So thank you all very much for watching and good night. Away, everyone. <laughs>